Hi, Lily. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Anna. <laughs> what did Ringo say before the Beatles broke up? I don't know, Lily. What did Ringo say when the Beatles broke up? Hey, guys, can we try some of my songs? <laughs> <laughs> Ringo joke. I just looked up Beatles joke and half of them were just slating Ringo. Here's another <laughs> one. Here's another one for you. Why is Ringo? Oh, wait. Actually, no, this is the antidote. Why is Ringo the best Beatle? I don't know, Lily. Why is Ringo the best Beatle? Because without him, they would be beatless. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and here's an actual good one that I was like, this is this is good. Okay. It's a shame the Beatles didn't make the submarine in that song green. That would have been sublime. <laughs> okay, I like that one. <laughs> I know, I really like that. I was like, that's, that's actually decent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lily. I'm Anna. Uh, and I'm Lucy. Uh, and and this... it... Sorry. Oh, here you go. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> it's already going wrong. And this is Liliana's pre-read media take. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions and media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. yeah. And, and we yeah. have a guest today. We have a guest. Woo! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's my friend and now yours too, Lucy. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Do you want to give us three facts about yourself? Oh, no! <laughs> no, no um, pressure, no pressure. <laughs> oh, your best Beatles joke. Sorry, no. Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> Lucy is my friend from Bristol. We've known each other since we were like 12. Oh, oh that's yes. so nice. Mm -hmm. Lucy, do you want to say any, any more words? And those um, are the two facts about me. <laughs> yeah, that you get today. <laughs> She'll throw in one more, like partway through the podcast at some point. You'll get that extra spicy fact. Look that's a promise. Li keep listening. <laughs> keep listening. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we're here today to discuss the 2019 film Yesterday, uh, which was direct, no, written by Richard Curtis and directed by Danny Boyle, starring Himesh Patel, Lily James and Ed Sheeran. For some reason. The famed actor. <laughs> famed actor Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Uh, so in England, a struggling singer-songwriter called Jack is trying to become a successful musician. His childhood friend Ellie manages him, but his work does not catch on. After another bad gig, um, electric power fall, uh, fails on Earth while Jack is riding his bike home and he gets hit by a bus. After waking up, uh, Jack realizes that everybody has, everyone has forgotten the Beatles and their body of work. Jack decides to use this to his advantage and writes and sings their music from memory in order to become successful. After recording a demo, Ed Sheeran, the real Ed Sheeran, <laughs> reaches out to him and asks Jack to become his support act. And while on tour, Sheeran's manager signs Jack to her label, uh, requiring him to go to Los Angeles. Uh, Ellie throws him a going away party and drunkenly confesses that she has always loved him. Jack still leaves and tries to remember as many Beatles songs and lyrics as possible to finish the album. And in order, but in order to remember more, more songs, he flies to Liverpool for inspiration. Ali shows up and they almost hook up, which was a correction I really enjoyed on your part because that was such an American <laughs> phrase to me. The fact that you insisted on like... <laughs> The fact that you insisted on like changing half sex to hook up. <laughs> really no, make it a euphemism. No. Uh, it's like but... my one change to this summary it was like, no, that must go. It's too vulgar. Stop <laughs> too it. Too vulgar. Yeah. We don't want like, I mean, we already have the explicit mark on our podcast. So like, I mean, <laughs> what do we have to lose? But no. <laughs> Um, but Jack has to leave the next morning and she doesn't want to move from being his friend to being his one-night stand. Jack leaves again for the States and finishes the album and Ellie starts dating Gavin. Gavin! <laughs> Gavin! <laughs> who made it possible for Jack to record his demo in the first place. Jack pushes for a performance on top of a hotel in, I'm going to say this wrong, Gorleston on Sea? <laughs> Is that how you I say that? Uh, I think, wait, hold on. Gaul, Gaulston. Gaulston. Gorst, there's an R in there, Gaulston. though. 
Gaul, yeah, Gaul, 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 Gaulston. Yeah, that makes know. sense. Sure. This is another part of the country. <laughs> Golston on sea where Ellie once arranged a gig for him. Uh, two Beatles fans who like who like Jack still remember the Beatles come backstage and thank him for making it possible for them to still listen to the songs since neither one of them can sing and the music has disappeared. <laughs> that would be me it- in that scenario. It would be like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> like imagine remembering the Beatles but then being like, yeah, I can't do anything with this information. That would be very disappointing. <laughs> I anyway, want to talk sorry. about. I do want to talk about this later, but generally, that would cause me more of like a mental health breakdown than rather than me being like, I'm gonna take advantage of this and become the number one musician. Yeah. <laughs> like if I woke up tomorrow and everybody would just sort of have forgotten something that's just such a huge part of something, I would just be like, Have I gone completely mad now? Yeah, like it's I like would, if I was yeah, like, I assumed I dreamt it or something. I yeah, like, well, I guess I made like, that. That up. was a really weird. Yeah, wow. I mean, I, yeah. It would be like, you know, those things where it's like, oh, if you get like dropped back in time, it was like, oh, I wouldn't be able to like invent anything or like invent the internet or invent like electrical power. Cause I'm just like, I'm not that skilled. Like I'd be like completely useless. Yeah, it's like same. that scenario. Like <laughs> uh, they hand him an address and he goes to see an old man living in a cottage by the sea. John Lennon. <laughs> <sighs> just, uh, yeah. This time a fake John Lennon as opposed to a real Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Not within the movie. Who in this timeline is still alive and has reached 78 years of age. John Lennon speaks to Jack about what's important in life and Jack realizes what he ultimately wants. He asks Ed Sheeran to allow him to perform at Wembley Stadium (laughs) and confesses one to the crowd that he stole the songs and two to Ellie that he loves her. Um, no pressure. Uh, the, yeah, the songs are <laughs> uploaded. <seem> worrying. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, and it's so sad because she's with Gav as well, and it's like, yes, they're, they're still together at that point. It's like, oh, <laughs> oof. sorry, Gavin. The songs are uploaded for free, and the record label will make no money from the music. Uh, Jack, Jack, and Ellie become a couple. They marry and they have children. Uh, the end. <laughs> the end. Imagine pitching that. Like, and then <laughs> and then he goes to talk to John Lennon. And then he goes to talk to Ed Sheeran. And, and then he gets hit by a bus and everyone forgets about the Beatles. I think it helps being Dante Richard Zimbano? Curtis. <laughs> it, wait. Yes. Wait, because like, Dante's explain. like, I went to hell and I met <laughs> Virgil. And then I went and I met my other favourite playwright. It's that, <laughs> but the um, Beatles version. <laughs> the singer-songwriter <laughs> version. The modern Dante's Inferno. <laughs> yeah, and it's like watching it is like watching Hell. No, it's not like watching Hell. It was actually quite good. I did actually really enjoy it, like a lot more than I was expecting. Which brings us on to our section where we talk about our preconceptions. In this podcast, um, we talk about the concept of a pre read text. Um, which is a concept that Rowan Ellis, who was a YouTuber, came up with. Um, And it's basically when you haven't read um, the source material of of a story or a piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what that's about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. It might not have anything or very little to do with the original source material, but like that's kind of how the cultural consciousness has come to kind of understand this cultural object. And we will also be talking about more generally about the preconceptions that audience members might bring to a piece of media. So... I thought we could start off by just talking about our own preconceptions or expectations of this film because I think all of us were a bit like uh, quite critical of it before we'd even watched it. I never uh, this is the thing I I remember seeing like trailers on like Instagram for this film and I remember like hearing about the concept and thinking okay that's stupid I'm never gonna watch this and Lily is actually the one that was like do you know what's actually fun to watch yesterday and I was like really and yeah yeah, because me and Lucy, so me, Lucy and our friend Esther have talked about this film, like discussed it multiple times, like before we'd watched it and just like how much we like hated it and how much we hated the concept. and It like made no sense. We were just really, <laughs> really critical. And then basically, yeah, me and Lucy were like quite drunk and we just watched like another, we just watched the Black Widow film. And when we were deciding like on what, what film to watch, we sort of saw Yesterday was there and we were like, oh, lol, we could watch that. No, we're not. I think it was you just kind of clicked on it and then it started playing and I was like well I guess I'm in this now and we kind of sat through it yes we're watching this because I went in being like if this isn't fun we can turn it off in half an hour and then the film was done so yeah yeah 
<laughs> yeah, I actually, yeah, I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I was expecting to. Like, I actually really genuinely like this film. Lucy, did you actually end up liking this film or were you too put off by... I think on reflection, when I was watching it, I was so determined not to like it because of kind of <laughs> all of the thoughts I'd had in like before. Right. I kind of knew that I didn't like the idea about it. Mm-hmm. So I was going in going, oh, I really The negative it. attitude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then looking back, you kind of think, well, it was quite fun, which is <laughs> annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like I was just loose enough because I'd had like six Stellas by that point to be like, yeah, this is fun. Like, this is great. I'm enjoying myself. And I think if I watched maybe it Maybe if now, I watched it sober, it. I would be, I'd enjoy it less. <laughs> or maybe I'd enjoy it more. Who can say? <laughs> Who can say? <laughs> But yeah, we were quite critical of the idea that, because the whole concept of the film is that like, um, the Beatles are the greatest rock band ever, and like, their music is transcendental, Um, or that's kind of the impression that you get from the trailer, because it's like, you know, everyone's forgotten about the Beatles, however, like, their music is still really popular, Um, which is actually something I think the film challenges in interesting ways that we can talk about later, but that was like one of our big problems with kind of the concept of the film. No, but it is sort of that. Like, I do wonder, like, if someone who was younger who maybe just just doesn't know the Beatles, I genuinely would like, 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 I don't know, is it okay for like a twelve-year-old to watch this? I, sort of. Did anything yeah. dirty happen in this film? I think it's what. What's the rating? It's like PG or something. Yeah, or twelve or something. Yeah, but I, I just really know. want someone who like didn't grow up with Beatles music, like. Beatles music was just something that played a lot when I was growing up so it's just something that I just always knew in terms of a body of work whether I wanted to or not so um, I'm just generally curious about like someone who doesn't know this music whether they would sort of listen to a song like yesterday and sort of be trans- uh, be sort of transformed and be sort of just also fall in love and be just thinking the entire time like oh my god all these songs are so amazing or whether they would be like why is everybody making such a big deal <laughs> Why is everybody so, uh, I don't know, transfixed by this guy just like playing a song on a guitar? Who gives a shit? Like, I generally don't know. Because well, I guess funny you should say that. Yes. Because I mean, Lucy is that person. Really? Well, Ta-da! I am someone who did not grow up with listening to the Beatles. I know about two Beatles songs. Um, wow. And yeah, it's not very one. impressive. <laughs> it's not very impressive not knowing the songs. <laughs> like and I, I think also yesterday. that was coloured by the fact that you were also going in with a sort of like I am determined to hate this film so <laughs> yes, maybe this isn't a maybe. control group I'm not sure um yeah <laughs> but it is also I think it is different listening to a cover version of a song you already know and listening yeah. to that song like if you go if you're listening to a cover to a song that you already know I think you generally like it better than if you hear it if you haven't already heard the original song Mm -hmm. and I think because all of the films kind of covers generally quite acoustic quite laid back you don't get the full Beatles experience so if you haven't heard the song already I think that the songs in the film aren't very impressive and they don't really fit with the narrative of being the best songs ever I think wait Anna you've got a quote we're going to talk about this later but you've got a quote from um the what's it called um the thing letterbox yeah, letterbox that was about kind of that thing. Do you want to? What oh, do you out? mean? I think my own personal hell is existing in a world where I'm aware of the original tempos and production of Beatles of the Beatles catalog, but the only versions available to me are produced by Ed Sheeran. <laughs> <laughs> just savage. I don't know. That's oh, so. I don't know. Maybe enough. because I'm ignorant or whatever. But I just assumed it was impossible to be from the British Isles and not grow up with Beatles music. <laughs> Is it because I've got boomer parents and that was just sort of what I think, they... I mean, that's why I know it, like, because I have boomer parents as well. I mean, but also I was it's kind just of... Ha- was sheltered specifically from the Beatles, I think, because my parents, parents were too don't cool like the Beatles. The Beatles. Really? So they never played it. Um, and I think that's really quite why quite a lot of people our age listen to the Beatles is, yeah. you know, it being on the radio or yeah. parents playing it. And that just never happened with me. <laughs> it's interesting because my mum was quite surprised that like, because I, I was talking to this to her about this and she was like, oh yeah, I'm really surprised that like Joe listens to the Beatles. Like, I don't think, but it's like, A, like you're the one, like we've been fed this stuff like kind of constantly throughout our lives. Like, of course, yeah. everybody like knows the Beatles. And it has that kind of nostalgia factor. And also it's just sort of seen as like, especially like I think Gen Z it's like a ta- like a sign of good taste if you like the Beatles because it's just you just is like it? in our cultural consciousness it's like 
Beatles are like good music and so like if you're cultured you will like the Beatles it's that kind of thing because they've got that kind of like they are like a great band so like I, so I'm not you know when people are like oh I'm surprised that like Gen Z like it's like why are you surprised like they're kind of held up as this amazing band so like you know it's sort of like something that's fed to us and something that is sort of like oh yeah you know if you like music then you'll probably like the Beatles like mm -hmm. I don't know. I think from my parents as well. I mean, I told you this, but, but uh, my parents had a lot of records, like a lot of uh, vinyl, but then their uh, record player broke when I was, I want to say maybe five years old or something. And so the amount of CDs they had was really limited. So it was like Etta James, then a couple of like classical mm. music CDs and like a lot of Doors and Beatles and stuff like that. Mm. But like the the my parents' collection, like because of that, just just because of the player breaking just all of a sudden shrunk to like very few things Beatles just took up so much more time in terms of mm. what I listened to growing up just because of that I remember we had like a number one um like best off cd but I just remember listening to these songs so many times yeah but I don't yeah. remember like having a visceral reaction as a because I must have listened to them before I was ever conscious of what I was listening to so I was never like you know what I mean? I never had that yeah. moment that maybe Lucy, you now has have had, where like I listen to a song by the Beatles you get for the to first experience time. It for the first time, yeah. I don't remember yeah. like consciously being aware of like, do I like this song? Do I not like this song? I've just yeah. heard it for fifty times. <laughs> it's just always been there in your head. Yeah. yeah. Like... I would compare it to this is a kind of similar example is because I grew up listening to ABBA, and with the new ABBA music that's being oh. released listening to the new ABBA songs is like hearing like an ABBA song you've never heard before yeah having grown up always listening to ABBA and it's that same experience of, that's really interesting because yeah. do you know what I did not listen to a single ABBA song my entire childhood because <laughs> my parents oh, hate them next film we do it's gonna be it's gonna be Mamma Mia we're doing Mamma Mia next yeah sure I still haven't seen that because I have no connection to that music whatsoever but that's a really good comparison yeah timely yeah because the album all the singles came out like a couple of days ago or something the new ones i think well like very recently yeah. anyway <laughs> so bring us back to um the pre-read thing that we were talking about so um i also got i've also got a note here that like you think it's a film about the beatles but actually it's a film about ed sheeran because <laughs> it's like a jump scare halfway I know. through you're watching a film about the <laughs> beatles <laughs> and then ed sheeran's there <laughs> Ed, why are you in my kitchen? Like, <laughs> Ed, what? Yeah, no, I literally read an article, or like, I read the headline to an article that was like, you think yesterday's about the Beatles, but actually it's about Ed Sheeran. And I couldn't find that article um, in the run-up to this, but I remember it quite vividly. I don't um, remember him being in any, like, trailer or any, like, promotion that I saw for the summer. It was always like, everybody in the world has forgotten the Beatles except Jack, which, for one, is also just not true, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Even, but like I don't remember there being any sort of mention of Ed Sheeran in any of this yeah um, oh I definitely saw the clip of him being like hey dude and then you're like ha ha it's like you know that kind of really funny joke that you get in a trailer and then it's like doom and you're supposed to laugh and you're like <laughs> <laughs> okay can I uh, can I ask just because Lucy and I don't know each other like did you have any sort of understanding of John Lennon growing up like as a person like do you remember like the first time you were sort of aware of someone mentioned like, that name or something yeah I think I knew more about John Lennon than I did about the Beatles generally like I remember Ooh. in primary school we had a whole I swear we had a history lesson <laughs> just specifically about John Lennon. John Lennon I don't know why and I think we wrote like an essay not a like a primary school style essay where it's kind of half oh a page God. or something but that's specifically that's what I always think of when I think of John Lennon I don't think I've learn anything new about him since that primary school history lesson oh but, um, yeah. yeah this is British culture Anna this is what we get taught in <laughs> to get a lesson on John Lennon great British culture great British history lesson <laughs> that's so weird yeah I did not have that wasn't part of my national curriculum that was that's not yeah it's not yeah. part of the national curriculum I didn't get that history lesson sadly <laughs> but yeah like I'm not I'm also kind of not surprised though in a way because you do get that kind of like like that kind of boomer memory of John Lennon as like you know the kind of like hippie who did good things and sort of like died too young and he's sort of like that kind of like kind of tragic kind of figure tragic political figure 
but also kind of like a kind of a bit of an enigma and kind of interesting because he died young so like he's got that kind of like that's why he's like a more one of the more interested that's why people are interested in him because of like the in, interest like because his death is interesting I guess I don't know I don't know yeah and then so I we guess wanted... you can kind of sorry you can kind of mythologize him mm-hmm. as well because yes. he oh, yes. died early you don't have you know modern what's John Lennon up to nowadays which oh, no, he's kind of Twitter cements him in that tweeting. space yes. of mundanity and said it's like yeah you know, he's this the yeah. enigma oh yeah he's not he's not boring because he's he's dead yeah yeah because he's yeah. got like interest that mystique I think I mentioned this to, I think I mentioned this to both of you but I thought I was like it's just like a little bit uncomfortable like because the yeah. film uses the, like the tragedy value of his death of, of his death um for like the emotional like weight it's like that kind of like, it's quite a pivotal moment in the film where like you know Jack decides that he's gonna you know what's kind of good about his life and it's like yeah it's that kind of the it's using his like him as a figure as someone who's dead and can't like consent to be used in this film like if I was a family member I don't know how I I think I'd probably feel a bit weird about them using him in this way like as a plot device and using this figure of him as this sort of like you know kind of like hippie dude that's kind of like quite flattening um like it doesn't yeah it just feels quite exploitative to like use a real person in that way and like use that image of him and not really explore what he was like as a real person yeah Um, Mm -hmm. yeah the thing is like uh from what i've read and again i didn't read like any quote from this but i guess sort of like the beatles consented to this and also mm. yoko ono sort of consented to this she was asked okay. but still it's i know what you mean like it's just it's this thing we were talking about how he was not a saint he was a real person i'm not a huge fan of this idea like that there are problematic people i think they're just uh, problematic just things you can do and think and say he was not he doesn't get he doesn't have to live up to like a sainthood idea just because it's how people remember him and i think that's mm. really weird so like yeah. do that to someone especially since he's dead and especially how he died like like when he says like i believed for what i uh, i fought for what i believed in and won sometimes that is so specifically vague in a weird way it's so bland it's so <laughs> deliberately bland and i was i've told anna this already but like lucy it made me think of that thing you said about how in love actually Hugh Grant is like the prime minister like they try really really hard to make sure that everything he says is really vague but like so it's like oh you know I don't like these policies we need to bring in some new ones um of Richard our own Cur- it's Richard Better Curtis policies exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. you need so to make just... everything universal I know and I wonder I wonder if also because it's the kind of it's the genre as well I don't know if we'd have different responses if it was like specifically a serious John Lennon biopic mm. that was going into oh, the, yeah. you know, intricacies of his life and it was kind of trying to be complex as opposed to kind of being the, just like a plot device in specifically mm. a rom-com genre, if that feels more exploitative of him saying, you know, go get the girl as the kind of final yeah. piece. Yeah, because he is like, yeah, because he is flattened to fit into the rom-com like as a plot point. Mm-hmm. Um, so but and it sort of like feels unfair to be like no the 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 rom-com must like go into like all of the details of this complex like person but then it's like (laughs) that's not what we're demanding either no it's like maybe don't maybe don't use him as a plot point in the like that's the kind that's the weird thing it's like you can't because you can't do him justice in like a rom-com in this sort of way when you're just using him as a plot point so maybe don't do that at all I don't know it yeah it's sort of just a weird moment and you can understand why they did it because it's like yeah you've got that kind of like emotional weight of like oh this is the person that died too young it's so tragic that he died but he's like here living his best life and like and that sort of like kind of feels really weighty in the film but like yeah it's sort of mm-hmm. not really fair on it's not true to life and it's not really doesn't really feel fair on him as a person either do you think that they should if... have got another maybe like paul mccartney yeah uh... <laughs> but then it's like yeah <laughs> But then you get why they went with John. Like we said, like he's like this myth- mythologizing around his death. Like you, you could, o- yeah. it could only have been John Reed. Like this is the one that would get the most emotional weight. But yeah, it's interesting they didn't actually have any cameo. Did- they didn't have any cameos from like the actual Beatles. So I was expecting there to be no. some, but there weren't. Do you think if they just sort of used like imagine if like the Russian fan of the Beatles had like had one VHS thing left over with like an interview with John Lennon or something where um, John Lennon would say something along the lines of like what's important in life is that you fight for the things you want uh, you want and that you stay with the woman you love and fight for her that kind of thing like a real interview that I'm sure exists somewhere would have sort of inspired Jack as opposed Mm. to like a fake life one 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you think that would have worked better? I, but then it's like the whole point, it's like, because the Beatles never existed, like, John gets to live, which is the weird thing. It's like, that kind of like, oh, because we've created this alternate universe, like, he gets to survive. And it's sort of like the weird implications of that, of like, Mm-hmm. so is I it kind know. of saying this universe isn't all bad because look he's still alive that's yeah. kind of also or it's sort like... of like if only the Beatles had never existed John would still be alive yeah. like it just feels it's weird. odd yeah I, d- I don't really know what it's kind of trying to say I think the Beatles cameo should have been um you know going to a coffee shop Paul and McCartney's Ringo. the guy, but he's, the guy Paul, behind the, Paul, Paul McCartney, McCartney is the, the barista bar. saying what would you like. he goes to Liverpool and then he's like, oh yeah, I never really got out of this town. You know, I just stayed in Liverpool my whole... <laughs> like, and, oh. But then he gives like a nice little speech that says something like, but you know what, I've been happy because it isn't all about, you know, glory. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have just found it too funny though. If it was just John yeah. behind the bar. Like, <laughs> I just... I couldn't it's really difficult to take this film seriously anyway and it's just like hello I'm John like behind not John sorry Paul like I'm yeah confused yeah yeah sorry I know John Lennon's supposed to kind of have the emotional weight but it didn't to me I just found it so <laughs> funny yeah like, same. <laughs> I fought for what I believed in and won sometimes <laughs> He just talked in a way where I just kept thinking like no one talks this way. I refuse to believe that like a random old dude that you see somewhere in like on you just again this is a complete stranger to him like when Jack uh, knocks on his door and he just randomly talks to him about like life lessons and about like relationship complications and I thought what you said about like um, love actually is interesting because Curtis Richard Curtis said we all we do all know John Lennon pretty well in our hearts and minds and that's exactly Mm. what this is this is our memory or boomer memory rather of a vague person and what you project onto him rather than what he really was like because you don't know this person you just yeah. didn't and like and also we know that like John Lennon was like not a perfect person in many ways like that's kind of understatement a bit like you know he was quite abusive towards his first wife he was like not a great father to his son like there's sort of like a lot of yeah, that's he- why the hey Jude sorry like to like jump uh, ahead no, or something please. but like but that's why the hey Jude thing pisses me off so much that's the point of that song Paul McCartney wrote that song for John mm. Lennon's son to cheer him up <laughs> because he was talking about like don't take it bad like that's the point of that song and like to then use this in this uh movie without referencing that at all and also like when he talks to the the fake john lennon in the oh sorry i just keep calling him the fake john lennon (laughs) (laughs) when he talks to him he says like there were complications when he talks to like how he is with the woman he was with the woman he loved or something like that he says there were complications and i'm like What is that referring to here? Because Mm. that is, again, so freaking vague. Yeah. And also, yeah. And they they don't bring up Yoko. Like, they're like, no, we know that that's a minefield. And people, like, we're we're (laughs) deliberately, very deliberately going to keep it vague, not bring up Yoko, because, you know, just people hate Yoko and are horrible. Like, we know that that will put people off. So we're just going to keep it very vague. You know, there were complications. um, But I thought what I believed him in and won. Sometimes. Well, sometimes. sometimes, and there were some complications. <laughs> some complications. Put that as an inspirational poster on your wall. <laughs> I want that on a shirt. Yeah, <laughs> I thought what I believed in and won. Dot dot dot, and on the back sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> I think maybe now's a good time to move on to the the idea of celebrity um seeing as we've been talking about John quite a lot oh and okay so this links in um when me and Anna were talking about this yesterday um sorry off-screen conversation um but we were kind of like you know that scene goes like so well it's like the perfect it's like the most perfect oh, idea yeah, yeah, of like yeah. meeting your hero ever it's like you know they you talk to them and they like tell you what to do with your life and like they give you like inspiration but it's like it's kind of the opposite of like what you're told about meeting your heroes and also like the opposite of you know in like the fault in our stars when like they meet the author guy it's and like that's what, a complete yeah. shit show <laughs> yeah yeah and that's what it made me i was like oh yeah it's like the, it's like the ultimate like good meeting of your hero compared to like the ultimate bad meeting of your hero where like you let the, they let you down and stuff it's like no they live up to like every expectation that you have of them it's a boomer mm-hmm. fantasy of meeting this like pacifist artist mm-hmm. who still paints he still has like 
creative outlet in his life. He's still alive. He was with the woman he loved, even though there were complications. Um, and he like sailed the world and he got to live to old age. And now he he's sailed like living... the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. And this idea that he then should have uh, just sort of sits you down and is like, just fight who, for what you want in life. That's the only thing that matters. And like, now I've, you know, now I've sort of, I have a second, like more zest for life now. And I know what's important now. Thank you, John Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, like it would be entirely, good. entirely different if he went and saw John Lennon and John Lennon said, oh, I always really wanted to be a singer, but I never <laughs> quite made it. Oh, yeah, good point. You know, <laughs> if you, you, you've got what it takes. You've got to go it for it. You've got to go for the fame. And then Have you just that rewritten? would be entirely different. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what genre is that? So like rom-com genre is like, you know, you go, you stay and you like, you know, you ha- start a family and stuff. Mm. This is like, I don't know. The kind of... The, that, that, like one genre. where people are kind of cutthroat trying to make it in the yeah. business and it's like whiplash but we, yeah whiplash <laughs> the whip come on lash jack yeah. <laughs> uh, i have a funny story to share about meeting a celebrity i think i've told you both Ooh. this but i'm going to tell it again basically yeah. so i like volunteer at like an art center or i did last year and um i like volunteered to steward this event that was with nick sharrett um lucy you know who nick sharrett is right yes, have I told I you this story before yes yeah probably. it sounds familiar but go ahead yeah so he like basically he's like a children's author no children, yeah, children's children's author but like mainly illustrator um and he was like doing a little sort of like children's like draw along session it was really cute um and he like so I was like supposed to be like collecting these like pictures from the audience for him to like kind of show at the front and he was like oh can you get me like four pictures please and I was like okay okay Nick because I was like let's Nick Sharrett um um but like I kind of panicked because I was like I don't think I have enough time to get all four so I got three and I brought them up to the front and he was like oh only three <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> so yeah don't meet your heroes because you will disappoint them <laughs> That's and it so will be sad. horrible you'll disappoint them in front of an audience <laughs> i'm sorry but what's the big deal about bringing him three instead of four i don't know he just seems so disappointed i don't think i i mean yeah i'm sure he was he had like a cold and stuff as well so i think he was just like a bit ill and like i'm definitely interpreting it like to be a lot more than it actually was he probably did not think about it that hard but yeah it was just like oh the <laughs> shame <laughs> I sent Lily the clip yesterday from Community where Troy meets LeVar Burton in the show Community, which is funny because Childish Gambino is actually referenced in yesterday. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. He, he like, still exists. Yeah. And then he says, <laughs> bless you, Donald, or something like that. Like, he's so, he's so, so happy that, like, Donald Glover is still, like, exists in this universe. <laughs> But just uh, Troy in community just stares at LeVar Burton and just cannot move. <laughs> and because all he, and then he sort of, you see him like backstage, like, uh, sorry, like in another room, just screaming. He was like, all I wanted was a picture. You cannot disappoint a picture. And it's like, the yeah. thing of like, <laughs> he never wanted to like meet him in real life. He just wanted like something that a fan would want. But it's this thing of like, I was talking to Lily about this, but. I am just horrified at the notion of meeting someone I admire or whose work I admire because I just know I would not be acting normally in that situation. I would not be normal. I would just melt down or just com- become completely silent or just strange. And I don't want to like creep yeah. someone out. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like if I met John Lennon, it'd be like, hi John yeah <laughs> you would just Hi. be like please give me I, I need a relationship advice everything's falling apart John Lennon please John help Lennon. me <laughs> John a call on the power of John I would be like why are you still wearing the same glasses you had since the 70s <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like John but like you look different it's like oh I've got contacts <laughs> Sorry, should we now move on to the idea of celebrity? Yeah, kind of sorry. Like, yeah, sorry. No, that's my fault. Uh, Anna, do you want to talk a bit more about this? In the movie, I th- God, what's her name? Deborah? Um, the Kate manager. McKinnon's uh, character. Um, she sort of talks about how they have to create an image for him in the media for Jack as a celebrity. And she says, if you don't have an image, then the lack of image becomes an image. 
so it's a so they do talk about this idea of like what celebrity is and like what this perception of our perceptions of celebrities becomes because a lot of these things are manufactured by publicists mm. and things like that yeah yeah and I just thought it was interesting like in terms of a persona because a kid named John from Liverpool is a very different person than John Lennon, the celebrity, the musician. Mm, yeah. And I was just thinking it was interesting how sometimes sort of like these people become like an image more so than a real person. How we know Lana Del Rey, but the fact that her real name is Elizabeth Wood Woolrich or Woolbridge? Crap. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Woolrich Grand uh, or like Norma Jean became Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. Diana Spencer just became sort of like Princess Di, just sort of these images that we have of these like manufactured understandings of a celebrity and their real persona or personality sort of just becomes smaller and smaller because sort of the job becomes being that celebrity. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about this in terms of gender after we talked, because I was thinking that I wonder whether we would do the same for like a female celebrity. Because we are happy in this movie that John Lennon got to be 78. But like one of the things that we love, I think, about like women who die really young is that we never have to deal with them aging. Mm. Like we love mm. the fact that they're sort of like frozen in time at this stage yeah. where like people found them to be like the most attractive. You mean like... Oh, that's a really good point. Like, yeah. Norma, like Marilyn Monroe never got to be like an old lady that people, especially since women are sort of like manufactured as sex symbols. And I was just thinking yeah, about really that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I just, I just think that there's like this thing and I don't know whether when that sort of switched, I think it's like a mainstream opinion, but there's this idea that there's like this public ownership of celebrities mm. and sort of blurring the lines between the performance and the reality. I'm just really uncomfortable with this idea that someone as a person becomes public domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like John Lennon is now public domain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that the film uh, comments on the fact that you're kind of creating an image yes, of celebrities that's was, and that's something yes. it makes fun of but then also it also yeah. does that itself it uses it it's, it's like self-aware but yeah you, you can't, can't be self-aware and also do it like that's yeah. not how commenting on. on this works <laughs> no that is really interesting yeah it's just like let's have it both ways like <laughs> but it still kind of manages to work though I think maybe mm. or maybe we sort of just ripped into the whole John Lennon part so maybe not but um <laughs> Uh, okay, which leads us on to uh, Ed Sheeran, who is also in this film, um, who plays himself. I think it's like the third time he's played himself in something. Really? Um, not, I don't, Did I he play himself up. in Game of Thrones? I, yeah, because play... well, he played a part, didn't he? So yeah, he basically played himself. Hold on, Ed Sheeran, acting role. I did look this up before, acting roles. That's so weird because I've only ever seen that episode once and I've seen like video essays about Game of Thrones now so many times about like why it sucked essentially like not that that's what they were called but that's essentially the tone of the video essays and every single time they bring up that scene and I've now seen that scene where he like just looks up after he's <laughs> sung so many times and she just goes like what's that song or something and he's like it's a new one. <laughs> Which again, like, yeah. I wonder if there's like someone who just doesn't know who Ed Sheeran is who would just watch Game of Thrones and be like, who the, what the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah, just like, uh, slightly weird scene. Yeah. Oh, he also played himself in Bridget Jones's Baby. Um, so, okay. <laughs> I've seen that movie. I don't remember him. <laughs> But she was at a she was at a concert or like at a at a festival at one part of that film. So I'm just weirded out that I've seen that mm -hmm. film and I don't remember him being in it. <laughs> don't remember Ed. It was so unremarkable. <laughs> Oof. I think it's kind of weird because like they do sort of give celebrities sort of this like avenue to like play themselves and make fun of themselves and mm -hmm. even if they're like known being I'm not saying that this is what Ed Sheeran is known for because I wouldn't know but like even if they're known to be like jerks or something that give them sort of like an outlet to sort of make poke fun at themselves and then it's sort of okay yeah yeah like he calls himself a, a, a ginger geezer at one point in the film yeah. <laughs> and that whole the line that's like I always I was always told someday someone would come along who's better than me <laughs> you're like Ugh. but I, I think I, again I think that line is self-aware I think which we can talk a bit more like the but idea because it's yeah, yeah yeah but is he known as like the number one songwriter of our time that's what I'm saying like see yeah the that's the issue <laughs> Ed Sheeran that's what was I not, struggle with yeah Ed Sheeran was not the original choice for this film he wasn't 
no number one choice was Harry Styles and then it was Chris Martin from Coldplay <laughs> <laughs> but again I don't know that those two are also I mean I get I that know. like oh, yeah yeah nothing sorry. will ever be as big as the Beatles I get it but like are those like that but there is like a thing of like John Lennon and Paul McCartney together mm -hmm. were like the number one like the most amazing songwriting duo or something I don't know that Chris Martin or Ed Sheeran or Harry Styles are known to be like like the most yeah. amazingly talented songwriters yeah and I think there's also something different about writing a good song and being a good songwriter because mm. one is kind of the idea of you know being able to write amazing lyrics and be really clever and I don't think Ed Sheeran's songs are that. And I think they can be oh, good songs, but he ouch, isn't known take. for like, no, but I know, agree. witty commentary. Mm. And yeah. I would also, I mean, I don't know the Beatles very well, but I would say the same for some of their songs. I don't think the actual song writing in terms of lyrics is particularly interesting. You don't think mm. Hello, Except Goodbye is the best song ever? I've never heard it, who can say? <laughs> but um, yeah. But or like the song where it ends. You don't think Opla D, Opla Da is the most amazing Opla song ever? Opla D, Opla Da. <laughs> <laughs> I do really like that one, actually. It's catchy and it's fun. But yeah, yeah, but it's like... It's not Sgt. Pepper's um, <laughs> the album. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that that's one of the things that the film really focuses on is the idea that it's people listening to the lyrics and saying, wow, that's really poignant, which yeah. I don't think the Beatles are particularly known for. <laughs> no, I don't think that's... Try. to me they are but like yeah. i will say like there's yeah. so many i mean i might just be uninformed no i don't think that's what it <laughs> you is, don't know I... what you're talking about lucy <laughs> <laughs> stop it Sorry. i was talking to lily about this as i was watching the film because i was thinking like the reason why that scene with yesterday works so well for me is because i've heard that song so many times and i still have like i love that song so it does sort of make me like emotional and it works but like, if you don't not like that song, and if you hear it for the first time, we're just, I don't know, just in general, just don't find it. I think Lily, you also said you weren't like emotionally attached to the song. So no, I've kind of always found yesterday a bit boring. Also imagine, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, really slow. Like, it's not like paperback writer. That one's got like pace yeah. to it. That one's got a tempo and paperback writer isn't that good. But like, I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't really like the slow ones that much. And some of them listening to it for the first time are in tears. And you think yeah. that's if your first time did you, you listen to a song, you're crying at it. You know, <laughs> very rarely that happens. I think I, I mean, think that kind yeah. of response is the kind of thing you get from listening to it multiple times and kind of getting a relationship with a song. I mean, that's me. how I experience music. But. Or maybe it's the shock of him writing like not very good songs about dinosaurs <laughs> up to that point. And suddenly they're like, Which? Oh, it's like the through. shock, <laughs> just like the tears of like, oh my gosh, what? I mean, I didn't have I to pretend anymore. <laughs> I mean, I know it was intentional, but that summer song was so shit. I mean, I know that was intended that way, but I was like, <laughs> dear God, like people like Ellie had had to listen to that song so many times because she was at every gig. Oh my God. That's true love. <laughs> <laughs> None of us were even remotely alive during this time. But one of the things that I always remember people talking about with the Beatles was that the thing that was so impressive about them is that they made it over to America. Like mm. they weren't just famous in Europe or something. Like they were sort of managed to sort of break America. What's the Yeah, they broke America. I remember when like 1D were like breaking America and I was like, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? And then they did and they were like, well. But that's yeah. the thing. That's why I was, that's why I thought the comparison with Ed Sheeran that the movie does try to make us make mm. is so weird because I'm like I don't know I don't... that Ed Sheeran is like known for me as like the person who managed to make it and I mean, like yes he's famous and successful but like he's not I don't like know the that Beatles I would... no yeah. yeah no yeah maybe they should have done it with One Direction that would have been amazing yeah. that would be <laughs> Beatles one. Uh, All of One Direction is the replacement Beatles. I want to see how many people would get angry about that. It would be great. <laughs> <laughs> they the, are like, a boy Beatles band. Beatles fans would be like, were a how dare band. you? <laughs> Beatles were a boy yeah. band. It's true. Um, I would have liked yeah. that. That would have been subversive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We'd have preferred the film if it, yeah, it happened that way. The thing is, like, when people talk about like we can never have another Beatles, they always sort of make it like no one ever makes music like this anymore. And I'm like, I don't know that that's true. Like in terms of like quality, so I don't think that's true. That's yeah. a very like um, 
subjective thing to be like mm. they never make music like this oh, anymore. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's I don't like, know what you mean Anna <laughs> and I was like dude that's because we were smoking pot at 22 somewhere in the 60s and you were like oh my god this is amazing and that doesn't <laughs> like your experience of music has a lot to do with how you consume it right like a certain music will just speak to you at a certain age and other music just will not and one of the reasons why the Beatles were big as they were is because they managed to break through but they were also allowed to there were so many more gatekeepers at the time in the music industry and they're just are, like there still are but like it was so much worse back then in terms of like who was allowed to make music because you just didn't have an avenue to just put music online like you do now so like this idea that no one will ever be as big as this is because now there's just so many more people who have access to put their work online mm -hmm. so you just have much more access to much more music and that's why like one band can never be that big again because nothing is that universally beloved if everybody would just have the access to be making music in the first place yeah it's mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot more i think i think it was in like a you're wrong about episode the one about like after school specials about how like mainstream culture is a lot more fragmented now it's like Mm -hmm. you don't just have like you know most people terrestrial television isn't you know like everyone doesn't like to tune in for the same show on a Saturday or whatever anymore it's like a lot more like you have your streaming services you have YouTube and you have your algorithm and so like everyone's kind of in their little niches like there is kind of a mainstream but it's not like the mainstream like it used to be yeah I think it's also like in terms of the technology that you have available like mm. MySpace was something that I wasn't really on that much but like a lot of like I think Lily Allen became famous because of MySpace for really? example yeah, even with YouTube, I don't really get like a lot of music um, suggested to me by YouTube that I like. I they, The algorithm is really shit in that regard sometimes. <laughs> when I started watching TikToks, I got like so much music all of a sudden suggested to me because the algorithm was just so poignant. Hey, yeah. do you like these like 50 <laughs> queer artists? And I was like, I've never heard of any of these people before. <laughs> And it's just whenever like a new technology comes along that just allows people to put music out, it just sort of gives much more of a, uh, like you said, like a fragmented You can actually listen music. to stuff that is like, you, yeah, you don't have to listen to the Beatles. It's not like the Beatles or the Stones. There's like yeah. there are other <laughs> options. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like more widely accessible because obviously there were other options at the time. So it was just like, these were the ones that were most accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you think about the music consumption, culture like back then you had to like buy a record or listen to the radio mm. to hear songs yes yeah and if you wanted to own a song you either had to record the radio or like I think that was later on or get a the kind of vinyl and now it's so easy to listen to songs and because of like music mm. streaming now it's kind of yeah you don't get stuck into well I know I like this artist so I'm just going to keep buying their things because I don't want to waste money and buy yeah. something I've never heard before and then hate it yeah um so yeah and it's not just like one chart that everyone listens to it's like many 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 charts and it doesn't work in the same way anyway because the music industry doesn't work in the same way yeah and then also the biggest bands aren't necessarily the best is the other thing <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what you mean one so direction equating <laughs> i don't know equating the... yeah size to quality isn't necessarily always the most helpful <laughs> It's also this thing of like who would be like the biggest band right now would be like I don't know like maybe BTS yeah probably BTS yeah yeah and I don't yeah. really I mean I I've listened to that butter song but that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> no sorry no about. I don't because again <laughs> I, I don't really listen to that much BTS like I'd like to listen to like I've listened to like one of their songs and I really enjoyed it but like I haven't really yeah I haven't really listened to that much BTS like mm -hmm. I definitely read like an article that was like kind of the like evolution of boy bands and it's sort of like k-pop has now become like or like in the uk anyway i'm not sure like if this is like global or just in the uk but it's like the kind of evolution of like popular boy bands and it, like k-pop is now like the boy band like it's sort of less sort of british artists i think I don't no, know. but that is the thing of like being globally famous like think about like there's billions of people on earth mm. i don't know like a percent of those people like listen to your music you're going to be massively successful a huge number of people but that still means that like a lot of people on earth just have never heard of you mm. <laughs> you know what i mean I yeah. don't know if like maybe people like were more aware of the Beatles just because there was less available but also because if music was talked about they were talked about yeah. you know it's like I don't know if you listen to queer artists only you can I don't know when I was growing up that wasn't really that possible because it was like Elton John Ricky Martin wasn't out yet so 
<laughs> queer in quotes. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about gatekeeping is because a lot of white artists at the time, especially in the 60s and 70s, covered a lot of black mm. artists and became yeah. massively famous with songs that weren't originally even by them. Elvis Presley is very famous for this, mm -hmm. just covering yeah. so many songs that then did not, like the original artists just were not paid fairly for like those songs being covered. And also those original artists just didn't become famous and successful like the white artists did that sort of covered yeah. these songs. It's like, yeah these like four white guys can like are like the image of like universal music like everybody can love them they are like it's like they're universe like they have universal appeal you're like hmm interesting yeah. it's not like it's a woman because you're like you know that's women's music or you know <laughs> etc <Yeah. laughs> no. they are white men yeah yeah well that's the whole idea of the how often yeah white men is kind of seen as the universal and then <laughs> anything different from that is like well that's for you know a subset. That's a niche. That's a that's, that's a niche. That's the niche. You know? That's a bit of niche. But, like that might not you know might not float with with all consumers. Yeah. So we'll just go with like. It's so funny. I watched the clip of him of uh, the British invasion of like these four white boys with the same haircut on the Ed <laughs> Sullivan show in America. I know that we're like used to different television, but like they don't move. It's so <laughs> odd. Like these. Oh, what, like the really static performances of them, just like. Yeah, just they're like, so stiff. Mm, 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 mm. I know they're so <laughs> stiff. It's so <laughs> funny. <laughs> like, but there's there's like that. I remember watching in history like a clip of like Elvis, and he like jiggles his hips a bit, and she was like, "Why do you think this clip got banned?" We were just like, uh, "I don't know." And she was like, "Oh, it's because it was too sexy. It was seen as too sexy at the time to be shown on like live television." It's like, yes, you must stand like a rod and just, just there to play your music. You play your guitar and you sing. You're not allowed to move. We watched like a, uh, in music class, we once watched like a performance by Elvis and they cut. Once he started like moving his hips, they moved the camera up a little bit so you only saw his upper body. Once he started like dancing with the hips, I guess, the girls started screaming in the clip. And, but you just saw like this upper body just like moving and you were like, what are they reacting to here? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Anna, you ask, would a teenager today fall in love with these songs like they did in the 60s and 70s? And Lucy, your answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, you made a point about like music as part of culture and cultural shifts, which is, I think, one of the things that me and Lucy and Esther talked about quite a lot as criticism of the film before we'd seen it. Yeah, that was our kind of big criticism. And if you want to yeah. make that point or, or Lucy, jump in, whatever anyone wants to do. Well, I think I was just going to say I've kind of made this point so much that it kind of feels like common sense now. But <laughs> so. yeah, that's how, but, most um... of that's how most of politics works. So just go on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I think yeah music is part of culture and the way that like things that we enjoy are based on the world that we live in I don't think there's any kind of music that's inherently great like if you mm. got the Beatles and then you played them to like a 12th century farmer I don't think <laughs> they'd say this is a bop I think they'd say what are you playing to me and it's because you don't have that like same understanding of music and I think the thing is, is there's huge cultural shifts since the Beatles. Mm. And I think they say popular now because they were popular then. I don't think that if they became a band now, they wouldn't have the same, yeah, the same yeah. kind of response. Yeah, it's like when you watch like a film that's sort of like a genre setting or something, you know, like you watch like the original sort of thing. Like I watched um, uh, Blade Runner and I really didn't enjoy it that much and it's sort of like it kind of set up so much stuff for later films but I just thought it was quite mm -hmm. boring and I was like yeah you watch something and you're like this is quite dull I've seen stuff that does, does this better but it's the first thing that kind of does that thing that sort of makes it interesting. With Beatles music I think what Lucy's been saying I think mm. in terms of I think that I would still fall in love with Beatles music like stripped down acoustic wise but I wouldn't like fall in love with it on first hearing it. There's a yeah. lot of albums that I love but th that's because I gave them actual like chance really sat down and like listened to an album and I was like okay I enjoy this song a little bit listen to it a second time and then by the third time I was really into it and like emotionally yeah. there even as a child this is so odd but I remember like hearing the song Yellow Submarine and being like this is so stupid and childish like <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just, it's so weird that we don't really think about these. The Beatles were inspired by the music that came before them. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And that was like a big, before I'd seen this film, I was like, but like, it doesn't make any sense because like, if there was no Beatles, then like the whole world would be really different. Like as a yeah. concept, this doesn't make any sense. Like, cause like they were really, really influential. And so you wouldn't have like Ed Sheeran in the same way as you do now, because like, they, was, they had such a kind of massive impact on music. Like, this doesn't make any sense. But then something that, like, that is something that the film addresses, I think, because of the whole, like, like, the concept isn't that, like, you know, the Beatles don't exist and therefore, like, the whole timeline shifts. It's like the Beatles don't exist and it kind of makes it very clear that, that they're not kind of, like, trying to look into, like, the implications of that. Like, when they kind of do that thing where they're like, you know, cigarettes don't exist, lol. Like when he's like, oh, I could really murder a cigarette right now. And then they're like, wait, what, what's a cigarette? And you're like, what? That doesn't make any, like, there's no way that the world would look anything like our world right now if cigarettes weren't a thing. So it's sort of making it very clear that like, it's not trying to go down the route of like, what are the implications of like the Beatles not existing? It's just like, in terms of like music now, it's like, no, just like, we, we, this is a rom-com. This is not a sci-fi like fantasy film. <laughs> Like, we're not going to, like, look at, like, kind of an alternate universe right now. We're actually just, we're just here for, like, the, the wrong com plot points. And that's yeah. what we're going to do with this concept. Which I kind of, I respect that, to be honest. It's like, no, we're not going to try and do that. We're just doing this. We're not going to try and explain it. This is just what's happening right now. You have to I go do think it. the cigarettes thing is, like, the weirdest one. Because, like, so many more people would be alive if cigarettes weren't the thing. Like... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of I mean, implications that's, there. That's yeah. So much bigger than the Beatles, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> maybe that was the main story, and the Beatles bit was just a subsection. <laughs> yeah. And then they were like, "No, let's just bring in the Beatles thing. That'll sell better with like audience. Like, the, <laughs> like, oh, I want to go see the new rom com about like the world where like cigarettes never existed. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that could get really morbid really fast. Like, oh, Nan, <laughs> like." <I don't> <laughs> <laughs> When he like asks for Coca-Cola, he's can I have a Coke? And his mother goes like, huh? Because Coca-Cola doesn't exist in this universe either. If his mother didn't know Coca-Cola was also referred to as Coke, then wouldn't she assume that he was asking for cocaine? Well, maybe cocaine doesn't exist in this universe either. <laughs> maybe, maybe drugs just don't it's, exist. It's a fully PG-13 universe. Maybe, yeah, like the Beatles couldn't have existed because the drugs didn't exist. And that's the reason. Oh, that... interesting. That's a fun reading. I yeah I mean you could be like all oh, the he's played a little song and he's like oh do you have any coke it's like haha I'm a rock and roller now <laughs> I think that would be fun <laughs> if his mum was like what a funny joke you just made <laughs> I suppose and then he's like no you think you're drink. a rock and roller <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I don't know why they didn't make that joke. That's the joke that well, everybody that's an easy makes. Joke. It's an easy, it was right there. It was right there. Yeah. Put that in the trailer for everyone to not laugh at. Yeah. <laughs> Ed Sheeran could say it. It'd be great. <laughs> Even if like the cultural shift doesn't happen economically, like record labels, if something works, they will replicate it. I watched the um, Katy Perry documentary um, years ago, a long time ago. <laughs> It's actually quite heartbreaking because you can see oh. her like crying about her marriage breaking apart. It's really like oh, emotional. No. Like they film her like just breaking down before she has to go on stage and then just like slaps on a smile and like just just ready for the stage. When she started out, she everybody wanted to be like Avril Lavigne and they the record label wanted to sell her as this like angry indie rock pop person. And that was just wasn't uh, Katy Perry's music at all you know what I mean yeah. like if the if the Beatles music didn't exist that would have also like financially made like a huge difference in like what kind of music got like mm, record deals yeah from with I, I was like from a slightly odd angle I think this movie has like a little undercurrent about the idea of the death of the author <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> because the idea throughout is that the origin of these songs don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And the big mm -hmm. thing about the death of the author is that texts don't have an origin. They don't have an author. They are just made up of like the cult, the kind of cultural milieu, like the stuff mm -hmm. around you. Yes. And it's kind of, I think that's quite radical. The idea that it's like exploring what happens um, when, you when a cultural center doesn't exist anymore Ooh, but so what the film does do is it stops being subversive because it's reunited with the author at the end it goes to John Lennon at the end yeah. and it's after that meeting that he says I didn't write these songs they don't belong to me and order is restored because 
the text oh. once again begins to the author. You've I thought made, that was wow. a fun little meta narrative. I love it. Nice. Oh, wow. I, I I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think that it implies that the context actually is important in the end. And I think it's that scene where they're like choosing the album names. And like, it's sort of yeah. like, he was like, oh, I wanted to call it Abbey Road. And they're like, well, there's no reason for us to call it Abbey Road because there's like no kind of connection to that place. And then like kind of going through all these really famous things that like have a very significant impact and being like, and like they're very like culturally significant and being like, well, no, um, like we actually, we're just going to call it like Jack Malik, one man. One man. <laughs> and it's sort of that like, yeah, like when you completely decontextualize something like it yeah becomes it becomes lesser somehow but like if you just kind of try and put it all up to like one individual genius like because like the whole the point of the beat I think I think it's actually quite because cool it's like the context is really important and like this was a collaborative process between band members and also like in the cultural context of like when the Beatles were making their music like it wasn't just all coming from them like it was it was like built out of that like cultural moment and they were kept taking inspiration from lots of different places and so just to say that it just comes out of one person's head is like there's something kind of sad about that as well. I think yeah. it was kind of interesting when he was going to Liverpool and I was watch, uh, was wondering whether that was sort of the filmmakers trying to address the fact a little bit without even mentioning it. The Beatles music came out of a working class environment mm -hmm. from a very specific place in England at a very specific time because when he tries to go see the strawberry field, they just don't exist anymore. Like yeah. those places just aren't, they cannot inspire him to write the lyrics because those places don't exist anymore. And I was wondering whether that was, I don't know, was that like done well enough to sort of be hmm. an interesting self critique in that moment? Or was it just randomly watching this dude like run around and be like, crap, I don't remember Ellen or Rick B. Yeah. <laughs> See, I think, again, it wants it both ways. It wants you to be like, yeah. oh, context is really important. But also the Beatles songs are transcendental. Like it yeah. kind of wants both things to be true at once. And I think, it, I mean, it does kind of like, you could kind of still argue it like, you know, oh, the context is important. Even though yesterday got some really big reactions straight away. Like when he tries to do in my life, like everyone's sort of not really paying attention. But then it's still like, you know, the um, record label are like, oh no, these songs are really big and they kind of massively take off. Um, so it's sort of still like, it has this transcendental appeal and yet it's still really culturally like grounded. Like it's it's sort of like, you kind of want to just try and say both things, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that really did bother me and I did text Lily about this and she was like, I knew you were going to comment on this, <laughs> is that they sing, saw her standing there which is just one of those songs that I grew up with. And then like at a certain point, you sort of listen to the lyrics. I did grow up speaking German, but like the first lyrics of that song, she was just 17. You know what I mean? <laughs> you see like Lily James's character, Allie, and sing the lyrics. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Outside <laughs> of like this like alternative timeline. Yeah. Why would no one ask a question? When he starts singing, when he's writing down the lyrics, she was just 17, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, wait a second. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, like, I'm not saying that like the music industry wouldn't be shitty enough to be completely fine with this and not give a crap. I completely believe that. But I think someone else would like yeah. be asking questions. Yeah. And, and I was like, why would they use this song? Like you spent 10 million <laughs> just on Beatles music rights. Like just pick any other song. I just yeah, it's like that so one. Odd. It just does not translate into like just just doesn't make like yeah. yeah. You couldn't really get away with writing that now. Like I mean, you probably still could, but like it would. It doesn't really work in the same way. And like mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's sort of yeah. And yeah it kind of acts against that thing of it being transcendental because it's like no, clearly it yeah. is a product of its yeah. time. And there is yeah. a yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you did want to use it, you could do an interesting critique. Mm. I know they yes. don't want to, you know, annoy wanna... Beatles fans, but it would be interesting if they were like she was just over, and they're like, excuse me, what? And then that really could be weird. the scene where he's like, oh, I'm gonna update and modernize this song. Woohoo! Yeah, no. I mean they kind of do like sort of similar. Like I think it's only. Sings, I can't remember which one it is. Is it in my life? And they're like, oh, what's this about? And he's like, oh, it's, it's, it's about something. And he just sort of makes something up. And then, oh no, or is it Hey Jude? And then hey it's Jude, the whole like yeah. changing it to Hey Dude thing, which I'm so, sure saying, like, people make. They're saying like Jude is too much of like an old school name or something. Yeah. They're like, no one's really called that anymore. And I was like, okay. <laughs> See, again, like <laughs> as someone Jude. who didn't grow up in England, to me, I'm like, I don't know that people aren't called. I, I knew a Jude, like my brother, one of my brother's friends or one of the people in his year was called Jude. It's called Jude. It was also though, like the thing you guys were saying about like um, having it both ways, taking this like immensely 
tragic song and not respecting its origin mm. but like at the same time it's also poking fun at the music industry in general by saying that they are the ones that make it as universally appealing as possible so they're like mm. just change it to dude, dude. yeah <laughs> and it's like yeah i get it's like you know oh it's actually really important that like the background of this thing and then you have john lennon come in it's like all oh, the context is really important but then you're still like yeah but the beatles are transcendental though so it's yeah yeah, I think it is a I think it is a critique on the like modern music industry. Um, I don't really know that much about the music industry or like enough to sort of say exactly what it's saying, but I'm sure it's saying some things. The actor from New Girl plays like a music exec person who then sort of reveals this big album and goes like, this is now called One Man Only. They talk about how he doesn't have anybody, any song featuring Cardi B. Ooh, Again, yeah. it's sort of like this weird thing of like, we're making fun of the music industry nowadays, but also bands used to like, didn't left like a rapper featured on their uh, music. Nostalgia. Yeah. At the same time as poking fun at the music industry. That's Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. definitely. And like, and kind of, and it's sort of like, it's showing me the lie of that as well. The fact that they've been like fiddling with these songs and they've ch changed it to like, hey dude instead. And so it's like, no, the it, music industry still has like a massive, like, is taking, like, you know, kind of has like a really big impact on this, but like, it's trying to pretend that it's this one, one genius thing. Yeah. And it is that like, idea of like the one genius, you don't need any sort of collaboration um, to like make a song better. And like, it's just the what you just need this one person to do it really, really well and just be a genius and to like, just take ideas out of nowhere, um, at, which it is critiquing. Was it, yeah. was it, was it the cut scene or was it in the movie where he talks to, I think James Corden and someone says, nowadays where music songs are written by six to eight people or something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That was in yeah. um, like the interview. I think it was like a dream sequence. I'm not quite sure what was happening with that one, actually. Because I like... had no recollection of this happening. <laughs> <laughs> I blocked it from my mind. <laughs> I do feel like it did feel like a bit of a fever dream because it was like two o'clock in the morning. We were both quite <laughs> drunk and it was just like, what is happening? With this stuff? Maybe Surprise because James Corden. I, I specifically forget everything that's got James Corden in it. It just leaves my brain immediately. <laughs> it was a bit, so there was like the interview where he's like, you know, on like the late, late or whatever, the, the show that he does and like he's like oh wow did you write them all by yourself and he's like uh yeah and then he's like well we've got two gentlemen here who claim to have written them instead this should oh, be interesting yeah. and then you see like the feet walking out and then he like wakes up or something i remember that was in the trailer and i was expecting that to be real and then it wasn't um or it was or it's sort of implied that because it's like a funny sort of like it looks see? like this is why trailers suck because they give you this impression in a trailer that like, oh my God, he's going to get exposed by the real Beatles. And then mm. none of the Beatles show up in this film. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And that's, again, the audience expectation. You're kind of like, well, there's going to be, you know, like at least one real Beatle in there. But then you get John Lennon, which I kind of feel like feels like kind of fits that and that kind of does it better almost than like if, although we've made our critiques of that, like, but it, in terms of like filmically, it does a better job than if it was a real beetle in certain ways that are kind of problematic mm -hmm. but yeah but it's sort of confusing in the film like what's real and what's not because of the whole like you know people have like lost like because of the whole like electronic shock thing it's sort of like things just start kind of breaking apart a little bit so it becomes a little bit kind of confusing like it gets a bit fever dreamy at some at certain stages you can also answer this i think because the movie depicts like a british and american people but i think mm. it was kind of interesting all the things that they picked that sort of disappeared were yeah. oasis harry potter coca-cola red hot chili peppers i mean again because they're british they wouldn't notice necessarily maybe yeah if also. other stuff wasn't missing yeah i think it's like it partly just like the cultural references it's like you know it will be the sort of like british cultural references yeah but yeah that is what the film is aiming for as well like that is also a choice that they made no i wonder if the movie was again having its both ways when he was playing let it be which is such an emotional song that people have such a like an emotional reaction to and his parents just not giving a shit i just just the neighbor coming by then ringing the doorbell like his phone yeah. starts ringing i love that scene so much. i like that scene a lot yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just sort of nice. parents being like no 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 i'm paying attention and you're like no you're not <laughs> you're not paying attention to me <laughs> and he's like this is one of the greatest songs ever written and they're like okay calm down like <laughs> okay and it's so <laughs> the best song of the world which is like a very fair reaction and it's sort of like and but yeah again it is like the kind of you have the yesterday reaction but then you also have the let it be reaction i remember watching that scene and thinking when when lucy when you were talking about like what's impressive and what is not to watch someone do but it wouldn't be impressive for me to watch someone paint a chapel no. i would be like <laughs> really but watching paint dry literally yeah <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, like I don't have enough training in art to like understand how impressive that is. Yeah. Like to me, it's just a very interest. Oh, that's very detailed. <laughs> Yeah, and also it's like if you were wa- literally watching somebody paint that much, it'd be like, I would get very bored. I'd be like kind of chatting <laughs> with my neighbour and like, you know, yeah. going and making a cup of tea and like coming back, like <laughs> not be paying full attention all of the time. Yeah. yeah. Also, he's but not writing the song. He's just I know. playing it for them. I know, it's, but it's just much more fun when like, you know, things just come into the world fully formed without any sort of, you know, co- like any sort of thought. You know, it's yeah. just one man, genius. Yeah. yeah, you can just, you know, write, you can just bonk it. Yeah, and then Ed Sheeran would be like, well, I always knew that someone would one day come along who was better than me. To best me, the greatest songwriter. <laughs> greatest songwriter in the world currently. <laughs> of all time. I mean, yeah. after Harry Styles and Dean Martin. <laughs> not Chris Dean Martin. Martin the Chris third Martin best songwriter in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it was funny. I, I don't know whether, again, I'm not sure whether that was like deliberate, whether that was like self-aware or whether that... So, I mean, they do take the piss out of Ed Sheeran because, like, he does have, you know, his own song as his ringtone and everything. Like, it's sort of like... Yeah, yeah I think uh, he's just not quite... He's not quite good enough. enough of an actor for you to yeah. know if it's a joke. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> or, like, is this... Oof. Is he really serious about this? He's like, I have been bested. <laughs> or is it a joke? Is it a Who joke? We don't know. know. <laughs> art music is such a collaborative experience for a lot of mm. people the idea like this makes sense in physical fighting it doesn't make sense in music for you to be i always knew someone would come along who's better than me if someone plays great music wouldn't your first instinct to be like, hey do you want to work together like yeah. write some songs together? i know it's going way- straight into the like the single genius songwriter kind of thing and which i guess is the yeah. thing yeah sorry I didn't yes mean to, no no but go. i hadn't heard the song that uh, Jack sings in the competition. And I was like, I wonder who's gonna win. Like I wasn't in comparison (laughs) to Ed Sheeran. I wasn't like, wow, this is- This is a real competition. (laughs) (laughs) What could possibly be the outcome of this competition? (laughs) But like, it wasn't the one sounded amazing, like much more amazing than the other. I was just like, yeah, these are two songs on a guitar. Kind of boring. (laughs) Again, no, but that's- (laughs) But that's true because they they go again like it's sort of again they're trying to have it both ways it's like in that moment it's like oh the music is trans- transcendental and I mean I don't know that might be I think Long and right, Winding Road is probably musically like if you know something about music it's probably quite good I, I, get, I haven't really listened to that one either I like know the title I don't really know it see I do I grew up with that song to me that scene just worked okay mm-hmm. there we go yeah, big, you're, because... you're the target audience yeah you're but that's the, the thing if you don't Again, I find that really fascinating. Like someone else would just be like, what do you mean you're not going to play a song? You don't know that you've lost yet. Like, <laughs> yeah. But again, having it both ways though, like in the movie when he starts playing in pubs on that kid's party and in the mm. beginning, no one reacts to the Beatles songs. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know what I thought? I think like your point about kind of like social media, I think because it's like the reason that he blows up so much is because of social media, like yeah. because he records it and then it blows up on social media. So it is kind of interestingly, it's still kind of like the like looking at sort of like the route to fame in the 21st century. And it's like not going through straight through a record company. It's like you kind of blow up on TikTok or whatever or on YouTube. And like that's kind of it is actually kind of addressing that in a way, which is interesting. It's not just like instant fame or like you're instantly signed. It's like, no, you have like here is the route that you can get to to get famous I don't know yeah but I think it was also it's interesting the people who are like this is amazing and the people who kind of Mm. ignore it like I don't know if it's suggesting that it's like oh here are the people who've got taste who recognize that this is like the best music ever like Like obviously Ed Sheeran because he's the best songwriter in the world everyone else is just like toddlers you know yeah good friends and they all cry when they hear it for the first time but you know other people just don't quite get the genius everyone else is just a toddler at like a children's like birthday party yeah like anyone <laughs> else like in a pub <laughs> yeah and if I was in a pub and someone was playing some music and singing I'd be like I'm not impressed by this no matter what it was like <laughs> <'cause> I'm, <laughs> do you not like live music in pubs I love a bit no, of like wow it sometimes makes me angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no they're all right well if they're all right anyway <laughs> Thank <music> you. 
Oh, I just want to like make the point about Wonder Wall, which I think my mum made to me, and I think everybody else probably noticed as well. But like the whole point, like they set up at the beginning, yeah. that, like Ellie fell in love with him because he played Wonder Wall one time in a school assembly. But then, like, Oasis doesn't exist anymore, so that didn't happen. But they, like, never addressed that that didn't happen, even though they I set think, it up. Did, what, what happened there? I, Lucy, my, what happened? I think what the movie was trying to imply by him realising that Wonderwall didn't exist anymore is that she would be in love with him anyway. Aww. So if, like, Aww. it would be ridiculous to be like, I'm 13, I'm listening to someone sing a song, I will now be in love with you for the rest of my life. Like, that's not how it works. It's not actually, and I the think... music isn't transcendental, it's like about it. the people! <laughs> <laughs> but I think they should have made, they should have done this better, because I yeah. think that would be a nice I point did. to make, is him be like, oh wait, I never did play Wonderwall, clearly this is like... Yeah, yeah. I love oh, that! Yeah, you didn't even <laughs> like this film, Lucy, and you're like, no, it actually does structurally make sense. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing more annoying than the one dude at a party who takes out a guitar and starts playing <laughs> wonder wall and you're like oh, i know you're a few of those people <laughs> <laughs> no I, i'm joking i actually quite like it when people do that i quite like wonder wall but that's just me <laughs> but it's not i love singing along to wonder wall at a party that's like my favorite part of the party is when we start singing <laughs> <laughs> so maybe like that's yeah i love it i've missed that i've missed that about I'm not going to <laughs> some of you lately missed that part that's of my movie. wonderful this is why well. i love this movie so much i was like yes <laughs> i feel seen <laughs> can i just say i love your reading that this like the whole wonder wall thing i love the fact i yeah. didn't even consider like they, that didn't occur to me at all that the whole point is that she would have loved him regardless that's really mm. sweet is that the lesson of the movie? Is it happiness, as Anna has put it? <laughs> the lesson of the movie? <laughs> happiness? The movie Question mark? Happiness. <laughs> <laughs> like what I sort of matters really all along? <laughs> I thought it really odd that it didn't like go back to the Beatles existing timeline. It was like, no, no we just live in this cursed just, timeline just... now. <laughs> <laughs> like I found that I assumed that it would be yeah, like, and then you wake like, up and you kind of no, the Beatles just continue to not exist. I know, and you've got to live with that. That's it's really strange. Yeah, yeah. And how oh, do you go from yeah. being famous to being like, I'm gonna quit fame, and then everyone just forgets about you? That doesn't happen as well. That's also yeah. yeah. No, but he's found love, and everything's oh yeah. No, people okay. don't just forget about you. Yeah, no, but he fun. would, but he would be true. like sued for the rest of his life for what he did. I, it's like a kind of a get like again. It's, it feels like a criticism of like the music industry. It's like and all this music is now public domain and it's free for everyone. <laughs> like and it's like okay, like I'm sure no one would then buy the rights and then make loads of money out of it anyway or like sue him. Yeah, it's like. Yeah. this utopia where that could happen since it's now published it would still make him really famous because people did yeah. love the music well that's the thing that gets addressed in like the alternate ending kind of because like ellie is like lucy have you seen the alternate ending to no i yesterday? haven't do you want to shall i send you a link and you can just watch that <laughs> because basically what happens in this ending is you actually i can't remember what actually happens at the end like proper end of yesterday is it just like and then something and then he leaves the stage and something. They just return to England. That's the thing. And then he has kids and no one reacts to him ever. Yeah, like he just like goes the... and plays in a school assembly or something. Yeah, because yeah. he becomes a teacher. The thing that he didn't want us to fall back on in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Becoming a teacher. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you go, you go, you go. Sorry. Yeah. No, but I just think it's so weird that, I mean, I guess this is also just, you have to suspend your beliefs to a certain degree watching anything. Given that this, like, everybody reacts to these songs, it's like, this is the best thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And now this entire album with not just one Beatles album, but a lot of Beatles albums, is just all on this one album. And that doesn't make him famous for the rest of his life. Yeah. But then in, like, the alternate ending, it's like, oh, you're going to be remembered as that guy that, like, everybody hates because you fake doing music or something so it's sort of like I mean it doesn't also doesn't address it he just sort of goes off and lives a normal like a, a normal life in inverted commas like in like I don't know Brighton or wherever. where do they live again it's like is it bright it's not Brighton Suffolk yeah mm. yeah no you're right it's, it, it just it ties it up quite neatly but then it is a rom-com so it's sort of like and then it was neatly over and mm. everything was still not quite the same but like fine so it's all good yeah does he grow his beard back? Maybe that's the trick. <laughs> Wait, I don't remember. Does he, a... Does he have a beard at the end again? Maybe that's the... Did he that's have a beard at the beginning? Yeah. 
don't remember that. <laughs> they 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 shave it when he gets into the accident. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's just one of those things in movies when someone puts on glasses or like takes off glasses or gets one haircut or shaves their beard and then all of a sudden everybody just doesn't recognize them anymore. That's I'm like thinking maybe he just grew his beard back and then no one remembered him. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah, okay, you've solved it. You've solved it. That's yeah. But the thing is, is that beards actually don't exist in the alternate timeline. So uh... <laughs> like, what's this weird thing on your face? Better get rid of that. Something strange from the accident. Yeah. For a movie that is ends this nuclear family heterosexual, I still liked it. I was very surprised <laughs> that I did. <laughs> it's my least favorite rom com trope where they're like, "Look, and here are the children." You're like, "That's yeah. such a boring ending." It's like <laughs> you don't children. have to show that. It's kind of <laughs> it's. It always does it when they specifically want to bookend a rom com to be like, "And look, they are together forever." Which I think is much yeah. more oh, yeah. boring an ending than just being like, look, they're together in this moment and then, you know, life will continue to happen. Yeah. I don't like where the end of... It was why the end of The Hunger Games really annoyed me. This is a left turn, <laughs> but it was just kind of like, and look, now they have children. And you, that's such an odd way to finish a series yeah. is to say, well, everything's happy now because there are children. It's fu- futurity, you know, it's the child's... That ch- you know, the mm. the future and the child yeah. i can't remember what edelman said about the child now but something like that i don't know yeah it's going from having reproductive futurism a, sorry yeah yeah it's going from a legacy in terms of songwriting and saying i'm gonna have a legacy in terms of genetic reproduction instead bum, bum, this is bah. the way that i'll put a mark <laughs> on the world I'm going from cultural reproduction to genetic reproduction <laughs> I don't know. Some deep reading. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I watched it twice. So once just to watch it and then to take notes. I did sort of forget after watching the first time that you see the kids because I thought it like mm. ends when they, she yeah, like draws the curtains. Mm. Is that in the original or is that in the... I, I remember that from the alternate version, but I don't remember that from the original. So, I don't remember the end of the original. So the positions are switched because in the alternate ending, she's the one that remembers Harry Potter, but he doesn't. Yes. <laughs> And like in one of the versions, uh, like she stands behind him, and in the other version, he's behind her. Yeah, mm-hmm. I like. I really like the fact that she doesn't. Oh, he doesn't remember Harry Potter in the alternate version because I like the fact that it's sort of like, oh, it's not just one person rem- like remembers things. It's like lots of different people have forgotten different things. Yeah. I think I like the fact that it again subverts the idea that you kind of know what's going on in this world. It's like, no, it doesn't make sense. Stop trying to make it make sense. Like it just doesn't. Like. <laughs> A guy called Jack Barth wrote the screenplay and he's like in his 60s now. Um, so it took him like kids to sell this for some reason, but it was called Carver Version. But the whole point of the original Ooh. was that Jack Barth said that if he came up with the idea for Star Wars today, if it didn't exist, he couldn't sell it because no one would really want to make that necessarily. Mm. And in the original, like, Jack does not really find success. He sort of becomes vaguely a little bit more successful, but he doesn't have this international career or something. That's like, a really gets, big... That's, he gets, like, slightly better gigs. That's a completely different film. And that's, yeah. like, yeah. kind of the reading that we were taking from it. Like, this doesn't make sense in, like, a modern-day context. Like, they're kind of taking it to another level to make it into, a, like, a massive rom-com thing. That's yeah. really... Yeah, when so I the read the original that, yeah. idea is our criticism yeah. of this film. <laughs> <laughs> but they apparently fought a little bit about the idea of who gets story credit because Richard Curtis just heard about the story and says that he didn't read it at all. And he does give story credit specifically to Jack Barth, but then yeah. like a lot of specific things from the original still do show up in the Richard Curtis version, so I have no idea who's yeah. telling the truth. But I don't know, I just... I, I <laughs> It's so annoying because like I I did find this movie really enjoyable and I just know that the other version would be very maybe more interesting but much yeah. less enjoyable maybe. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, no, I kind of agree with that to be honest. Yeah. I think yeah. Also it had Ella, uh, not Ellie, as like Jack's long-term girlfriend. There was no like falling in love. So it just wasn't a rom-com. Which is oh. sort of what Richard Curtis mm. made out of it. Yeah. I think it's like they knew that they it's it's interesting like Rich Curtis heard about it and was like yes I can make some money out of this because he's like <laughs> yes it's a it's a rom-com with Beatles songs like yeah Rich Curtis rom-com plus Beatles equals lots of money like 
you just you just know that you're gonna yeah get a good good comeback from that like and Anna you mentioned yesterday again when we were talking about this film that like um rom-coms that you don't really get many mainstream wrong or like mainstream release rom-coms anymore um well they used to be these big especially in the I want to say late 80s and like 90s you had all these Mac Ryan Tom Hanks mm. rom-coms and these huge movies that just got I want to say like about 50 million to make a movie there were big movie stars Sandra Bullock was in a lot of rom-coms it was just something that was uh, they, that they spend a lot of money on since the superhero genres took over studios are more likely to spend 200 million on a movie that they assume will make back 800 million and they don't really want to spend 50 million on a movie that might make 200 high risk high reward type of thing which is also mm -hmm. how you get a lot of really shitty action movies that no one wants to see that really fail <laughs> And I do think it's kind of interesting that this movie got greenlit because To All the Boys I Loved Before is one of those examples that those type of movies in terms of their budget just moved to streaming. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what True. the pandemic is going to do to this whole thing, but I just thought it was interesting that because when I uh, saw the trailer for it, I was like, oh, this is a stupid concept. I don't want to watch this. I didn't think, oh, this is a rom-com. Mm. Yeah. But it is a rom-com ultimately. Like, you could yeah. Have it's about childhood friends, unrequited mm -hmm. love, and then someone yeah. turning around and being like, you've been here all along. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually, that's really interesting, because, like, you'd think that, Anna, you're quite a good, like, you are kind of the target audience for this film, in a way, because you really like rom-coms, and you also like the Beatles, and it has that nostalgia factor, like, for you. So it's like, this movie should really work for you, but, like, for some reason, like, it just really didn't, or, like, the kind of concept of it just really put you off. Just for the reference sake. Uh, I don't know what nostalgia specifically means in terms of its definition. I was not alive in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, because like, you're older than me, I just, th yeah, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, but maybe like childhood nostalgia and nostalgia. Yeah, like, that's what I meant more. Yeah, that you were brought up listening to this music I'm not, I'm rather not quite than sure, like, you were brought up listening to it on the radio because it was new music <laughs> and it just been released. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe also, you know what, I think it's also because of the cynicism that I have. I don't think that most people who watch this went into it thinking like, this is going to be shit. Because that's mm -hmm. the attitude I watched this with, because I was, oh, yeah. like, everybody's I mean, forgotten yeah. the Beatles except Jack. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's like people watching this film are paying for a ticket. Like, you don't pay to watch a film that you think you're going to hate normally. Um, yeah. 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 Also, I've also, in case you are listening, or our lovely listeners, in case you don't know, Richard Curtis is quite famous for like four writings at a funeral, Notting Hill, Bridget Jones Diary, Love Actually, like we said, and also randomly War Horse. <laughs> 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 I just looked through his filmography and I was like, what? <laughs> Wait. I, I didn't know that. I didn't I, I didn't watch it, but from everything I've talked to you about this film, I think at some point, I don't think that's a rom-com. <laughs> no, no, it's I've read the book. I've like Michael Perger was another amazing author that I've, I've got all his I've actually because I'm in my brother's room right now and Ooh. he has just getting out my lovely box set of Michael Perga books. I just have Ooh, oh lovely. Wow. Look, I had so many Michael Perga books as well. Whoa. Michael Wapurgo. Once you've read one, you've read them all. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's like literally no point. Like, kind of. I also had like a um, famous five like um, box set, and it's like That's kind so of great, nice. but also like I know I really like them, but like you kind of read like the ones that are kind of quite formulaic. You end up like reading five in a row and just being like, I can never read another famous five novel ever again. Like mm. the same with Michael Wapurgo because they're so like it's kind of the same formula every time. It's just like you just get really sick. Like box sets are such a nice idea, but they don't really work. With books because yeah. you're just like I can't like, read another read book yeah I've read that I've <laughs> just the read main this character book. I've just finished Jack instead of John you know yeah. <laughs> can I just say the image you just showed of that horse on the side that looked really vaguely threatening <laughs> <laughs> just the horse eye just staring at you <laughs> it's, it's seen th it's been through a war it's, this is a horse of PTSD that's a war horse <laughs> that's a war horse <laughs> yeah that's a war horse hold on there it is there's Warhorse. Wait, there's a story with a lion. Yeah, it's Butterfly Lion. Yeah. I like the one with the cat. <laughs> oh, oh, Adolphus Tips. I've not read Adolphus, I didn't read Adolphus Tips. Tips. Yeah. The amazing story of Adolphus Tips. I, I liked like that Cool. One. Cool was the one about the boy who was in a coma. That was quite... Oh, I didn't hot. read that one. I really... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
wait, there was also Caspar, Prince of Cats. That was the other. There's the few. No, it was ones. definitely Adolphus Tips. I remember Adolphus tips. tips because yeah. there was someone whose feet was cold, and so they put them in the mic in the, in the microwave. And that, <laughs> <that's Robert>. <laughs> 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 yeah that stuck with me the feet in the microwave no <laughs> in the oven okay right <laughs> the episode started off about yesterday now it's turned into one about michael, oh, about Pergo. michael Pergo. i because i don't think they've actually adapted any of his other stuff for like films have, have they ever done private peaceful maybe I, that was a play as well i remember that's that being the one play. they would have done that's oh, yeah, read I that one in private school. peaceful um in mm. there was one in the tobacco factory <laughs> Aww. in a um you know that's a very small theater in Bristol but yeah thought it was really funny that <laughs> Richard Curtis had something to do with a movie that looked so serious mm. <laughs> I know yeah I mean it's Maybe kind of just like having a... you know yeah he was like I'm gonna be an auteur I'm gonna <laughs> Um, I was wondering, do you think that the characters in the movie are named after Beatles songs because like Ellie for Eleanor Rigby and like Lucy uh, after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Yes, I don't know that, I think whether that's that was intentional. definitely or... correct. I think I think they probably <laughs> did. I can't think yeah. of Jack though. Is Jack just because it's like short for John and then he meets John? Oh, so he's the counterpart to John because it's Jack, which is short for John. Oh, uh, yeah, oh. we go. Uh, it's just a generic name. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> every man character uh, this is maybe too oh, random Jack. but at school in music class we had one test on the Beatles and was it um, like what's the name of like the, like yeah what are the names of the Beatles yeah no Sorry. joke that was the first question it was like name two of the members of the Beatles and then like the what? second one was name three genres of the music that the Beatles played and I remember the last question was name five Beatles songs and I got <laughs> you're not real <laughs> And maybe five of their songs. <laughs> and I got so bored because this was such a basic test. If you grew up with the Beatles music like mm. I did, like this is nothing. And I was so bored. And I just wrote down every single Beatles song <laughs> title that I remembered. And then the teacher was, I don't know that one. You have to bring in a CD that has that, that song on it. And I was, <laughs> you know that age when you like, this is John Mulaney joke where he's, you know, when you're like 12 and you're like, don't look at me or I'll kill myself. Like that was... <laughs> Like, and I was I need to like bring in a CD that he's gonna play in front of the whole class. No. And then he still made me. And I, one of the, the songs that he didn't recognize was Revolution, which, in case you don't know, starts with them screaming. Okay. And, it, and I was just <laughs> sitting there, and every single kid in class just turned around and looked at me and was, What is wrong with you? What kind of music do you listen to? And I was, Oh no. Oh, God. oh no. I will it's die. Like... like, please, the ground should swallow me now. Please. No, this was it was so horrible. But also during the test, the girl that was sitting next to me, she wrote John McCartney and Paul Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, but I saw it looking over because I got bored. I felt writing down, I felt Beatles title that I knew. And then I was looking at her and I was trying to make a switchy move. I was like, switch, switch the name. <laughs> But again, if you don't grow up with this stuff, why would you know that he's called John Lennon and a John McCartney? <laughs> yeah, I think I used to get that confused. And then there's like, oh yeah, and then there's just George, which we haven't mentioned in this episode yet, but like he exists as well, oh. I guess. Maybe, Is there I'm a not quite sure. George? There's George Harrison, he's the other one, yeah. but I get confused with John Lennon sometimes. Um, I genu- I've never heard the name George Harrison before. <laughs> 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 George, I don't I don't really know what happened to George. Like I'd say I'm a, like I'm a fan he's of the fine. Beatles, but he's just fine. But he never like appears. It's like Paul McCartney's always in like every other like Rihanna song, not Rihanna. I every think other that's Rihanna why song, I know but they did appear that one time. But yeah, like I mean J- Paul just can't get enough of the spotlight. He's just like, no, no, I'm still I'm still here, I'm still relevant. Like, guys, don't forget about me. I'm Paul McCartney from the Beatles. And so you're like, oh it's look, it's Paul who's making another guest appearance. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, George Harrison Harris is, is dead. Yeah. He's died. Oh, he is dead. Oh, he is. He died in 2001. Nobody realised him. Nobody I'm so sorry. Came. I'm sorry, George. Nobody came. Oh, <laughs> When I was looking at like, the dad jokes for this episode, every second one was a racist one about Yoko yeah. Ono. 
Oh, I know. And, yeah. And every other one was about how much every member of the Beatles was an asshole, like just sucks and is a loser, except for John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And I was, did you guys have any personality in the 60s? It was just, I hate this one Beatles member. Or like, yeah. I hate Yoko Ono. And like the first time I heard a joke about how Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles. And I just remember thinking, like, so okay. <laughs> I don't really understand this concept of blaming this lady for a band ending that was already working for decades at this point yeah and it's like yeah she didn't even break that's all a lie and it's that it was all falling apart anyway and yeah yeah it, it's yeah poor Yoko poor George poor Ringo I'm so sorry that I was like he's fine <laughs> he's fine <laughs> I guess he is fine <laughs> But no, genuinely, I didn't realize. I mean, I guess like when they do the the like um the interview in the film, you only see two pairs of feet walking. I think because everyone's like, oh, there are two Beatles still alive. But I just didn't realize that George did not exist any like not exist anymore. Like George, <laughs> this is like the <laughs> ultimate timeline. It was just three of them. George did not exist. <laughs> I was like, oh, why didn't George make an appearance in this film? Oh, wait, no. <laughs> but like, oh, he's been dead all my life. Gringo Star, as far as I know, like, imagine, because like, I know what Paul McCartney looks like even now. Because I, he's like yeah. in the media. I imagine that Ringo Starr at least like, can live his life without getting bothered. I imagine. Maybe. I don't know. I've seen him and he still kind of looks like Ringo Starr. But it's probably, I mean, he's more out of the spotlight. I think what he does now is he just like makes art on Microsoft Paint and then sells it for like a lot of money online. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. Do you guys want to go into uh, rom-com tropes maybe? So when I say tropes, I don't necessarily mean that they're negative. There is like a, uh, as a trope, there's like a parent of the Asian lead uh, with a white love interest. Uh, they gave Lily James bangs, brown hair and glasses and put her in sweaters. And then we're like, well, this makes her like look less attractive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and at some point, I think when she's at the train station, she goes, I will always be Ellie with the frizzy hair. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're Lily James, like shut up. Yeah. Like, yeah. Also, when he confesses his love to her, she says, I would have styled my hair or something to that effect if she would have known that she would have been on camera. <laughs> and I was like, you look perfect. Like, there's not a single hair out of place. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Jack also makes fun of her pajamas at one point and her like pink robe, which again, these weird segments where someone comments on the fact that she looks ridiculous and I'm like she doesn't though not in any yeah. scene that I've seen does she ever look ridiculous also you see her eat a lot of crisps and just fast food and stuff which the skinny people in movies just always is something that you just get shown over and over again mm -hmm. um the only black character in the cast is plays a stoner and an incompetent yeah, lazy know. person yeah although I did like when he like called out Ed Sheeran for like his rapping being shit yeah <laughs> in the beginning when jack shows up to ali it's like raining it's very dramatic and he like thanks <laughs> oh yeah oh <laughs> yeah uh you have a drunken declaration of love uh you have a quirky best friend who when they go to liverpool he randomly mentions that he lost his virginity in a churchyard <laughs> you're like okay um <laughs> <laughs> you have the chasing after the love interest in an airport we have we have a train station which i do think Wait, is lovely. when did that happen after the almost one night stand oh oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah um you have the best friends to lovers trope like just like childhood sweethearts sort of a thing you have a public declaration of love which we could talk about a little bit more maybe yeah Ooh. um yeah also everybody ends up paired with someone and like gavin <laughs> Gavin, when he doesn't get the first brunette, he gets the second brunette. I know. <laughs> Did we know who she was? Did they explain who that woman Lucy, was? Lucy. That it... was Lucy. Wait, who's Lucy again? Sorry. Lucy was like her friend. She was just randomly, I think she was like another teacher just heard her in Ellie's house at one point. Oh, yeah. That, oh, oh, her. Yeah, yeah. Her, was... My favorite oh, character. <laughs> my favorite character. Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the only reason I noticed this is because of the name and because that actress was on uh, Pole Dark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we want to talk about the public de declaration of love? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah. <laughs> poor Gavin. That's all I can say. No, I don't know. Like, also, <laughs> poor, also poor Lily James slash Ellie. Yeah. Poor, like, Ellie. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. That is a stressful, it's like the whole idea of, 
like the issue with something like a public proposal is yeah. always putting pressure on someone and that is I think the most public you can get in terms of declaration and it's that thing as well. in Wembley. and the movie doesn't really kind of go into this because everyone forgets about him as soon as he leaves the life of fame but that is also like putting someone else into a huge media mm. spotlight if you think about that as well like people have yeah, good point. They're yeah. not just kind of gonna be like, well, that was exciting and forget about it. People are gonna, you know, take pictures, take videos. Yeah, like, like that miss is... this Ellie and then like follow yeah. you around with a camera. It yeah. is a kind of like half doxing style thing. Oh, like, look, <laughs> like it is. Oh, it's yeah, funny. it is. Because and it's then... also, yeah, the, he's connecting her to his scandal in that moment. Yeah. yeah. And it's that thing of all that, because it's a rom com, we're like, oh, we know this is requited, this is all fine because of the genre. If it wasn't, um, that would be a very scary thing. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, you might love someone, but you might still not want them to shout about it in Wembley Stadium. Or like, also she's with Gavin, so you don't, also there's that dynamic, they just yeah. skip, they're just like, yeah, it's fine. Gavin was just a stand-in <laughs> anyway. It's like, actually, well, you know, someone's feelings are going to get hurt here. And it's also just a bit of an awkward situation to put someone in. And poor yeah. Gavin, I don't know. I, mean, he ended I think up that's right. just the problem is, is the movie kind of at the end frames it as this huge the kind of big rom-com romantic gesture yeah. at the end which is the staple of rom-coms mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a very romantic gesture yeah personally. I think especially yeah with the like now she's part of this media spotlight it's like think about what <laughs> yeah. you've done like this isn't just like a room full of random people like or it's not just in an airport where no one's really gonna care like this is, yeah. yeah there's like a big like the whole point of this thing is like you know the idea of celebrity like we've explored this quite a lot like in this film and that yeah you're just dragging someone into that the implication yeah sorry I was gonna say if it's like in a party with people you know like a friend a friend party um that's the kind of like <laughs> the close to a faux party <laughs> faux party that'd be a bit of a faux <laughs> Isn't that what you call it when you go to a party with your friends? You're like, I'm going to go to a friend party. <laughs> party. <laughs> um, yeah, like if they like that idea, that's the kind of thing that you do it with, not with a whole stadium of strangers. Anyway. I've always found those things to be so figurine, just because, I mean, for one, it's also putting this public pressure on you to say yes, because obviously if you say no, whatever the proposal is in that moment, it's going to yeah. be like, oh no. Even if like, I was in a relationship with someone and someone proposed to me at a party, I would just leave. The idea of having like any kind of intimate uh I don't yeah. know, decision in that moment with a person that I care about, being in public? No. Yeah, it feels, feels no. manipulative. I'd be like, you're being kind oh. of manipulative here. Like, yeah. I, 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 maybe you're coming at this from a good place. Like, or even if you're like, oh no, like it is requited, but you're like, no, but this is like kind of, I don't like the situation that you put me in. Like, why Why do yeah. you need this pressure here? Like, wh why do you need me to say it, like say something in front of all these people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also like- yeah. It also feels a bit like the kind of back to back thing of, I've given up something, but I'm going to get myself something. So he doesn't have like any time to just kind of sit with that oh, kind yeah. of giving something up. It's like it's instant, this will go right. Instant reward. Instant, I would have liked to have seen, seen him be a bit sad for a bit and then be like. Yeah. It's like the clean cogs of like, this is like the, the jumps that you take. And it's like, there's no kind yeah. of like, there is no like um, yeah obstacle to like getting your final goal. It's like, no, these are the beats of the wrong common. The beats happen and there's no sort of like, it's like not how real life works at all, but it's like how yeah. rom-coms work, apparently. Yeah. I was kind of surprised that Ellie didn't have more of a bad reaction to him having plagiarized all of these songs. But it was mm. sort of this thinking about what if he only on stage says that he plagiarized the songs and then goes backstage and says like, I'm sorry, but I love you. It would be like, what do you mean you love me? Let's go back to the song plagiarizing. What do you <laughs> yeah. Mean? Yeah, it's like you don't give them a chance to like he doesn't give her a chance to be like this thing. Like it's like, no, you gotta think about this thing now. Like you gotta like yeah. nobody think about that. Think about that. Like I'm actually a good guy though, because like I've got a love interest. So yeah. you know, it's a big happy ending. There's a reason for this. Yeah. It's not just, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, when I watched the movie for the second time, Gavin and Ellie do get along in the recording session. They do laugh and stuff the entire time. So it's so weird to me that how okay everybody is with because one of the things that ellie says is that gavin always puts her first or something mm -hmm. and he just sort of goes i just want you to be happy and i'm like what 
this is the guy that allowed this guy to like court a demo in the first place and now he's actually i would like that girlfriend of yours if i may thank you <laughs> i did not once look at the clock in this film and i think that's because himish patel is really enjoyable to watch yeah yeah he was really mm. so he was really good in that in that role yeah yeah he did a very good sort of like, oh, I'm now in a really difficult situation. Like, this has been a really, really difficult situation. <laughs> yeah, he did a very good, like, I'm a little bit out of my depth. And like, I was just going to say, did he sing his own, own songs? Did he do his own stunts? Did he sing his own songs? Yeah. Ah, that's good. Mm. I did like the fact that Ellie doesn't do the thing that female characters do often in these type of movies. But when he makes it big and has to go to LA, she's not. Yeah, she course, doesn't go I'm with not- him. No. Yeah, she's and like, she's... no, I've got to be at work on Monday. Like, I, I yeah. teach. Like, I have a job. Which I think is not unlike that was that was one moment where they did kind of subvert like rom com stereotypes. I get, although I don't know actually, I'm not sure if that's sometimes people are like in rom coms, just like, no, I can't go with you. I need to save my job or whatever. But like, no, I did appreciate that. She was like, I, no, I, I have a job. I I can't just go to LA. I did like the fact that this movie just doesn't give a shit about explaining everything and sort of just leaves it to you to sort of think you're part of this doesn't make sense or this doesn't make sense yeah the mm-hmm. yesterday cinematic universe of just like <laughs> like the next film is like yeah it's kind of exploring the implications of yeah like no cigarettes or like no yeah. kale <laughs> yeah, each someone film goes on a, a mission to invent kale <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, oh it's the Richard Curtis saga I can't wait <laughs> oh Oh, one thing I wanted to bring up about the alternate ending, actually, that I've got to say was like the fact that like <laughs> when he's like, oh, I've written you a song. It's an original this time. And then he plays like what is so obviously an Ed Sheeran song. And then like <laughs> it just brought me out. I was just like, but it's not, though. And then it kind of I mean, it goes into like Ed Sheeran singing it. But it was just like, <laughs> but it's just like, he's like, this one's an original. And you're like, no, it's an Ed Sheeran. So it just, okay, just like, the dissonance amused me. <laughs> I'd have liked to think you'd have done that and then just sung a really bad song and she was like, well, at least you tried. <laughs> that would have been so much better. Oh. It would have, like, no, you never were meant to be a songwriter. <laughs> oh. But that would have fit into your theory, Lucy, about like the fact that she just doesn't give a shit. Like, if the yeah. song would have been crap, that would yeah. have just fit in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or what if he sung a Wonderwall at the end? Because she'd obviously never heard Wonderwall I mean, before. Yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. okay. But I think I like your, I think, yeah. I, there was also like um, um, a tele, telegraph, telepole, tele, wait, what was the, what's the name of the site that you got the thing from? What do you mean? Which one? Laptop. No, the one that's like with the reviews and I can't remember the name. Letterbox. Letterbox, Let- yeah. <laughs> Telepol. Laptop. What was it called? <laughs> Letterbox, that one. There was like one review that was like, you know, like how could you like set up like, you know, an ending where like you're obviously going to play Wonderwall and then like not play Wonderwall. Like you set it up so perfectly and then it doesn't, <laughs> you don't play Wonderwall at the end. What are you doing? There was also one review that was, so this movie is like a um, a tribute to the Beatles and then you're going to have the disrespect of playing Ed Sheeran over them fucking for the first time, really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really weird in the beginning when his friends, after he had the accident, bought him a really expensive guitar and he was so mean to them about it. <laughs> I was like, that's a lot of money. That's so yeah. mean. Like, hmm. I mean, he had also just like come out of, you know, just had a nasty accident. So he's probably not feeling his best self at that moment. Like, that's kind of just like, but no, but yeah. He's like so He should <laughs> stay saying thank you for a bit instead of being like moving on thank immediately. <laughs> There's like a certain amount of time you should spend thanking someone proportionate to the amount of money the present was. <laughs> the, mo- the money is the important part, yeah. So yeah. How much money they spent on that gift? Can I see your like receipt, please? So I know how long to thank you. I need for. to know how many seconds this bag has to last for. <laughs> There's a direct ratio. Uh, I have a scale. Before I start being mean to you about how you don't know the. I have an equation are. about <laughs> how long. Uh, yeah, and then I can talk to you about the Beatles. Yeah. 
Like the fact that the Beatles fans aren't out to expose them, I thought that was lovely. Yeah, I, that yeah. was a nice twist. That was a nice twist. Mm-hmm. And, and it, when there's just like that yellow submarine like floating <laughs> in the back of a, I was like, this is getting a bit freaky now. Like I was like, this is, this is just like I feel really paranoid. There's just a yellow submarine there. I was like, what's going on? But yeah, no, it's really nice that they're just sort of like, oh, it's really thank you for like giving us this music again. We're not here to expose you. We just want to say like, yeah, thanks. Like we really like the song, yeah. these songs, but we just don't know how to sing. So, like. Yeah. yeah. For the benefit of Mr. Clyde was completely out of order. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he says this thing is like, it's like I've been to a foreign country and I finally found someone who speaks English. And that was like the most, and I was just rolling my eyes at that so much. And I was like, you know, most people's experience is that on earth. Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? <laughs> Yeah, I was like reading your notes. I was like, I was just laughing so much. You're like, this is the most English <laughs> sentence. It's like most places you go will speak English, but like most, <laughs> if you speak another language, that's not the case. Like, it's the most English sentence. Yeah, like, it really oh, is you're abroad though. and like nobody speaks very good English. You just don't understand people and they don't understand you. And then you finally find someone who speaks good English. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think we've come to the end of our discussion on yesterday. If everyone's made all the points they want to make, um, so we so we come to the point in the podcast where we give um, our listeners some recommendations for media that we've been enjoying. Um, so, um, Lucy, as our guest, would you like to start? Yes, I will start. I'm very bad at giving uh, recommendations for media, and I'm also very bad at deciding. Uh, what film to watch if I am given the option. So I'm going with something that I've mentioned already today. I'm saying if you haven't already listened to the two new ABBA songs, they will bring you joy. <laughs> they will bring, they brought tears to me as an ABBA fan. Um, and that is what a little bit of joy that I think needs to be listened to. Yeah. Is the new album called, is it Voyager or Voyage? It's like Star Trek Voyager. Um, like, it, I think it's Voyage? Voyage? I think so. It's really, the album art, like, fits so perfectly with all of their past album art, because all of the albums are now oh. on my phone, and it looks like it's the oh. kind of next album. Oh, um, so nice. So, I just yeah. have, like, Abba Gold on my phone. <laughs> oh, what an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> the best ones. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Voyage. Fan. It is Voyage. Voyage, yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't heard the rest of ABBA, listen to their entire back catalogue and then come on to the, uh, these two songs. Thank you, there's a lot of recommendations two songs. Yeah, yes. thank you. <laughs> you never have to give another recommendation now because you just recommended the whole of ABBA. So everyone can just <laughs> get on with that now. Yeah. Um, I was going to recommend, um, I watched a film with my mum the other week. Um, it's called, I think it's called Barbarian's Film Studio. And when my mum first, said it I thought she said barbarian and then I thought she said Bavarian and I was like Bavarian <laughs> I know where Bavaria is um but it's Bavarian um and it's set in a s- film studio in Italy um in like the 80s or something in the 70s um and it's like this um sound producer is sort of like employed like he's this British sound producer comes over to Italy and can't speak the language um but like he's employed um to do the sound mixing on this horror film and it's like a kind of meta sort of film where it's sort of like it starts off with him you know like kind of doing the sound on this and kind of gradually becomes more and more like becomes a horror film in itself and it's really kind of quite interesting the way that it like it sort of does that like kind of plays with film as like um as a medium is really cool and it also like I'm really bad with horror but I think possibly this also lets the film down a little bit but like it it isn't that scary because it's sort of like I feel like it could have been an hour and it would have been better than being an hour and a half. Like it's quite long. It feels quite long, but like, because it's sort of quite slow, it never gets too scary. Like if it kind of ramped up the pace a lot, it would be like too scary for me to watch. And I'd have hated, I just wouldn't have been able to watch it because it's slightly slower. It's probably a slightly less good horror film, but like I can actually enjoy it and watch it. So that's what I recommend. And I think it is, it's definitely worth watching. So Barbarian Film Studio, sorry, it's a long recommendation. Yeah. No, that sounds lovely. And I did sort of see you like taking a note somewhere and I was like, that's not how you spell Barbarian. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so um i was gonna recommend like lucy i was i'm gonna recommend two songs because i was gonna recommend uh penelope scott's song rat 
which originally was called Elon Musk Rat because it was about her experience growing up on the West Coast, going yeah. into coding and stuff, this whole Silicon Valley um, mm. culture. It's a really interesting song, but it's just called Rat now with, uh, how do you guys say, umlaut? Yeah, like, umlaut. That's what like we say. Like, yeah. It's like rat, but the A has two points over it. So red. I'm, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. If it's the German, um, yeah, maybe. Uh. Um, and then today, talking off the experience of listening to a song more than once and then getting really emotional. Today, I listened to the song Feel Better from the same album. And it's about this breaking up and not wanting to feel better because that means that the relationship would really be over if you like Aww. do feel better. And I just, yeah, been very sad listening to the song all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to recommend Rat and Feel Better, which is on the same album called Public Void by Penelope Scott. Thank you. Who I discovered on, discovered, <laughs> who I found on TikTok. <laughs> Never heard of her before, but I love her. Yes. Nice. Cool. Point. Yeah. <laughs> you can find us on, where can, we, where can they find us, Anna? Um, on... You can find us on Instagram, on Twitter at Liliana Pod, L I L I, and then A N N A Pod. You can also write us an email if you want with uh, recommendations for films we should cover, for media we should cover at pre read, uh, sorry, Liliana's pre read media take at hotmail.com. Uh, the all the links to stuff is going to be in our media notes in our show notes Lisa you were going to do a joke we said you could do it oh so I have to look up a Beatles joke yeah and make it a good one or a bad <laughs> one um okay it could be um, the first one you see <laughs> right is everyone ready for some comedy <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is how every great stand up starts. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I am about to deliver a comedic performance. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I have every Beatles album apart from one. I need help. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Thank you. That was so nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for bringing your yes, humor. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. <laughs> if we ever do cover like Mamma Mia or something, would you be up to like doing that with us? That would be so fun because I still haven't yeah. seen that. I specifically like Mamma Mia too. Here we go again. That's cool. <laughs> oh yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. Okay, I, I thought you did I like prefer it. it to Mamma Mia one. <laughs> Oh, I oh, stop recording. I wanted to have you saying that you like Mamma Mia 2 on record. Like, on I record. still have my recording Oh, I've got that on ah, mine. Nice. <laughs> I do. Gotcha. The first time I watched it, I hated it. And the second time I watched it, I was like, this is the best film I've ever watched. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I don't know what happened. I love the idea that there's like a Mamma Mia extended universe then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Remind me what happens I in think... those films. Does like someone get hit by a bus and then they like forget that ABBA yeah, ever existed. Yeah, they forget and ABBA then, ever existed. And then everyone has to dance and do the it. song so they remember what ABBA is. Oh my god, yes. isn't, isn't Lily James though in one of yes, them? Yes, Lily James is also oh my in god, it's the Lily, Lily James, James Cinematic universe. universe. <laughs> 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 she should love me a TV. Here we go again. <laughs>